What's going on there, YouTube, and welcome back to another comic book video. All right, so we are going to do a full story video. A full story video is when I sit down, take a bunch of videos that tell one overarching storyline and combine them together into one big video. Now, today's full story video is going to be about Fall of the Mutants once again. Now, last week, we did the chapters that really only focus on X Factor. Today's full story video is going to focus on on the X-Men alone because when it came to Fall of the Mutants the whole storyline was all three teams having to deal with different problems on their own. X-Factor had to deal with Apocalypse but when it came to the X-Men they had to deal with a character known as the Adversary and had to give up their lives to save the entire world. And so here are their chapters when it came to the Fall of the Mutants X-Men event. I do hope you enjoy. What's going on there, YouTube, and welcome back to another comic book video. Okay, so we're going to continue our coverage over X-Men comics. And with that being said, we just finished our coverage over the Mutant Massacre storyline. Now, when it came to the Mutant Massacre storyline, that was the first ever X-Men crossover ever done in Marvel Comics. But now we have to work our way up to the fall of the mutants. Now, this was not really a crossover. It was really more the idea saying that all three X-Men teams at that time are going to face different kind of problems that could technically change the teams completely. Now, remember, around this time, you have three X titles, New Mutants, Uncanny X-Men, and X-Factor. And so, like I said, when it came to the fall of the mutant storyline, it was not really a crossover. None of these teams actually meet each other. Instead, each team is going to have to face their new problems on their own, which is going to change their teams completely in different kinds of ways. Now, we're going to have to work our way up to that crossover because there were a lot of stories being done between the Mutant Massacre and the Fall of the Mutants that we have to talk about. In particular, Uncanny X-Men number 215 through 218. And the reason why, because the X-Men team is getting reshuffled. You're going to have some new members to the team while some old members are put on the sideline. And you see what I mean as we go through today's video. And so getting into Uncanny X-Men number 215, we do pick up with Madeline Pryor. Now remember, when it comes to Madeline Pryor, she is the clone of Jean Grey. But around this point in time, no one knew that she was the clone of Jean Grey. Matter of fact, everybody thought that she was just a woman that looked very similar to Jean Grey. Now, she did go on to marry Cyclops, and they had a child together, better known as Cable. Now, over in X-Factor Comics around this time, Cyclops left her and his son behind to go form X-Factor, alongside with Angel, Beast, Iceman, and the newly returned Jean Grey. He has not told his wife that Jean Grey has come back to life, the woman he used to love before her. And so right now, he's hanging out with her over at the base of X-Factor. Now, something else to mention is that when it comes to Madeline Pryor, she does not remember the early days of her life. Now, we all know why, because she is the clone of Jean Grey. But when it came to the X-Men stories around this time, they said because she was in a plane crash and she was the only survivor of that plane crash, she had forgotten everything else about her life before that plane crash. And so as we dive into Uncanny X-Men number 215, we see her kind of reliving that plane crash as the plane does crash and she is the sole survivor. Now, right after she's able to walk out of that wreckage, she's then grabbed by two paramedics who then throw her on an ambulance. Now, right off the bat, 
we are told that these two guys are not paramedics. Matter of fact, they are marauders. Now remember, marauders were the main bad guys in the Mutant Massacre storyline. They were going around killing off Morlocks left and right. And the question is right now, why did they go after Madeline Pryor? Because the opening pages of this book, we are left to believe that this is a flashback. That right after she was able to survive that plane crash, she was grabbed by the marauders, but she was able to get away. Well, not really. She almost got away, but as soon as she tried to get away, she got shot from behind by Scalp Hunter. And so we're left to wonder, did this really happen? Or is this a dream? And so then we pick up with Storm, who is currently getting ready to send most of the X-Men away. Now, the reason why, because three of the X-Men got seriously injured in earlier story arcs, Kitty Pride, Colossus, and also Nightcrawler. And so they need some time to heal up. The other four characters who are also being sent away are technically newbies and they need some training and that would be Rogue, Psylocke, Longshot and also Dazzler and so those four characters plus the three who are injured are all going over to Mir Island to get healed up but to also get some training in. Now Storm and Wolverine they are going to stay behind but the reason why Storm is doing this is because she feels like the mansion is not a safe place for the newbies nor the ones who were injured because again this story arc comes right after the whole mutant uh, massacre storyline and so storm is afraid of the idea of the marauders coming here and attacking the place and so she'll feel more comfortable if everybody is away getting trained and getting healed while her and wolverine stay behind to handle different kinds of situations now we do jump back over to Madeline Pryor and when we do is her now waking up in a hospital after being shot in the head by a scalp hunter. Now again, we have no idea if this is a flashback right after the plane crash or she's having some kind of nightmare. Either way, we are told that she was able to survive the shooting done by Scalp Hunter and she was brought to a nearby hospital. Now, of course, they had no idea how to identify her and so they had no idea who she was. But as soon as she does wake up, she tells them, my name is Madeline Pryor. But again, we're left to wonder, is this some kind of dream or is this a flashback that takes place right after the plane crash that she has supposedly survived? But then we have to jump over to Wolverine and Storm. Now remember, those two characters stay behind. They didn't go to Muir Island because they have to handle some things in the area. And one of those things is Sarah Gray. Now remember, Sarah Gray is the sister to Jean Gray. Now when it came to Sarah, her main goal around this point in time was to speak on behalf of the mutants, to tell the world that mutants are technically not evil, that mutants can be great people and be great for humans and mutants tends to work alongside with one another. Now when it came to Sarah, because she was labeled as a mutant lover, you had all these different groups out there who were trying their best to get rid of mutants go after her. And matter of fact, over in the X Factor comic, her house was blown up when Cyclops and Jean Grey were trying to pay her a visit to tell her your sister is alive again. But unfortunately, she was not home and the place was blown up. Now, our two heroes, they did survive. And luckily, Sarah was not home, so she also survived. And so this is Storm and Wolverine coming here because they heard that something happened to her house. Now, when it comes to Wolverine, he tells Storm, hey, Sarah's not dead. Sarah is alive, just not here though. We gotta figure out where she went to. But that is the moment Wolverine realized he picks up two other scents, Cyclops and Jean Grey. And like I said, around his time, no one really knew that Jean Grey was alive again, except X-Factor and the Fantastic Four. X-Men had no idea that Jean Grey is alive. And so for Wolverine, he's all like, 
this can't be true. There's no way I should be able to pick up Jean Grey's scent, but he does. And when he does, he goes berserk and he on accident knocks out Storm and runs off into the forest to kind of process the whole idea that the woman he loves is now alive again. Now we do jump back over to the other members of the X-Men who are currently on their way over to Mir Island. Now on the way there we get the idea of how seriously injured Kitty Pride is because in the Mutant Massacre storyline she was shot in the back by one of the Marauders which affected her powers to the point where she can no longer stop phasing. Her body is always in phasing mode, but the problem is though, the phasing is getting worse to the point where she's no longer able to communicate, and sooner or later, she may not be able to think anymore. It's kind of like she's going completely ghost, and sooner or later, she'll just disappear completely. And so now, we're left to wonder, can the X-Men find a way to turn her powers off and to save her? Now we do jump back over to Storm. Now when we do, is Storm waking up after being knocked out by Wolverine, but realizing that she has been captured, and she was captured by three characters, and that would be Crimson Commando, Stonewall, and Super Saber. Now these three characters used to be heroes in World War II. But of course, as the war ended, they were told to retire. Now at first, they didn't want to do that. They wanted to keep using their powers as a way to help the world out, but unfortunately, the government said no. But as years went on, you had more and more different kinds of evil people popping up. And with that happening, they felt like they should use their powers as a way to punish these new kinds of evil people. Now, the way they do it is kind of like they capture you and then they release you into the forest and they are going to hunt you down and your goal is to get away and survive if you don't well you're dead now the reason why they kidnapped storm is because they believe that storm was the one who burned down the house of sarah gray because they found her knocked out next to the house thanks to wolverine now, we kind of find out there is another girl there, and that would be Priscilla. And the reason why she was kidnapped because her and her boyfriend were selling drugs, and that is a huge problem. And so now, they're going to kill her as well. But like I said, the way they kill you off is that they're going to release you in a forest, and your goal is to get the heck out of there and to hopefully get away from them. If you don't, you're gonna die. And so now it's up to Storm to save her life and this young girl's life before they are killed off by these three characters. Now, as we jump into Uncanny X-Men number 216, well, we pick up with Wolverine. And remember, when it came to Wolverine, the last time we saw him, he went berserk as soon as he was able to pick up the scent of Jean Grey. And because of that, he went so crazy like an animal that he's out there in the woods just running around. And he does get hit by a car. Now, usually, if somebody's hit by a car, they most likely get killed off or seriously injured. But Wolverine does not get hurt that bad because of his healing factor. Now, the couple that did hit them, they're going to be somewhat important for this chapter alone. But again, it's reminding us that thanks to Wolverine now finding the scent of Jean Grey, he's kind of wondering the possibility that she is alive again. But getting back over to Storm, we do currently see her with Priscilla. And you have the two ladies trying their best to get away from all the different men who are trying to chase them down. Now, when it comes to Priscilla, she wants to go ahead and set up traps as a way to kill off the three men who are currently hunting them. But for Storm, that's the wrong thing to do. Matter of fact, there has to be a better option when it comes to getting away from these guys. Now again though, when it comes to Priscilla, she's kind of young and reckless. And so for her, killing is the only option. If you're trying to survive by somebody who's trying to hunt you down, then your only option is to kill them before they kill you. 
But for Storm, it's more of maybe we are able to show them the wrongs in their actions. Their ways are wrong and they need to find different ways to actually help the world out. But getting back over to the other X-Men, you currently have them heading over to Mir Island. And matter of fact, they do arrive at Mir Island. Now, when they do arrive, we kind of focus on Rogue. And the reason why, because Rogue feels very upset about the idea that her and the rest of the team were sent away to come to Muir Island while Storm and Wolverine stayed behind. Because she's very worried about the idea that something could possibly happen to Storm or to Wolverine. Now, there is something I forgot to mention, and that is Storm. Around this time, Storm was technically powerless, and so she is waiting for a phone call from Forge who might have the ability to give her powers back to her. And so that is why Storm has been unable to use her powers in this entire story so far. Either way, when it comes to Mormon Tagger, she reminds Rogue why she is here. To one, make sure their three friends can heal up properly, but two, to get some proper training. Because right now, you have new members to your team, and they need to know how to work with your team before they're able to go out in the field. And so then we jump over to Crimson Commando, Super Saber, and also Stonewall. The three characters who are trying to chase down Storm and also Priscilla. Now this is the moment where you do have most of the members of this group beginning to think that Storm might be actually innocent. Now the only reason why because Storm told them like hey you may have found me next to a burning house. But that does not mean I was the one who burned the house down. There is a possibility that I'm actually innocent. Now we know that Storm is innocent, but the thing is they don't know that. And so they believe that Storm is guilty. But because she did say that, you now have Stonewall believing that maybe she could be innocent and the possibility that their ways are actually wrong. And so you have the three men argue, but the conversation is cut short when you have Crimson Commando realize where Storm and Priscilla are trying to head to. And so he says, listen, this conversation, we'll have it later. It's time for us to go find Storm and also go find Priscilla. And so then we pick up with Super Saber using his super speed as a way to travel around the forest at a faster pace to hopefully find Storm and Priscilla faster than his two two mates would. Now he does set off one of Storm's traps and when he does, well Storm realizes if she is able to stay close to him then he'll be unable to run away and so her goal is to take him out without actually killing him. Now when it comes to Priscilla, she's still down with the idea of killing people and so she begins to push big boulders down the mountain to hopefully crush super saber but to also crush storm as well because she thinks that if storm is able to take out super saber she will then continue to try to protect priscilla which means that the other two guys Crimson Commando and Stonewall will still come after them because of Storm. And so her goal is to kill off Storm, kill off Super Saber, and maybe the other two will call off their hunt. But then we pick up with the couple we saw earlier that had hit Wolverine with their vehicle. Now while they're trying to fix up their car, Priscilla arrives. And when she does, at first, she tries to pretend that she is somebody who needs help. Except she then pulls out a gun and shoots the both of them and then takes their vehicle. Killing them and leaving them there. Now Wolverine finds their dead bodies and that right there takes off Wolverine even more. Now we kind of find out that, well, unfortunately, she didn't get that far. She crashed the car and so now she has no choice but to try to find a new way to get the heck out of that forest. Except before she's able to do anything, somebody comes from behind and knocks her out. 
Now, while Priscilla is knocked out, that is the moment where you have Stonewall appear. Now, when Stonewall does appear, well, he tries to go after Priscilla, except Storm appears and Storm is able to take out Stonewall. But right after she does that, well, then you have Priscilla wake up wanting to kill Lost Storm because again, she believes that Storm might bring the others over to her and hey, Stonewall just appeared, which means Kristen Commando could not be too far away. Except before you have Priscilla being able to kill Lost Storm, well, Kristen Commando kills her off. And now it's him saying, one down, one more to go. Now it's time for me to kill Lost Storm. Except Wolverine is there as well. Now, Storm does not want Wolverine to actually help. Instead, what she wants to do is take on Kristen Commando on her own. And the reason why, because one, she wants to prove that she is not evil, but two, this is her battle. And so once she's able to actually defeat Crimson Commando, she's all like, listen, I'm not gonna kill you. Even though you wanted and tried to kill me, I'm not gonna kill you because it's time for me to talk to you. It's time for me to tell you to do the right thing. Like, yes, you're trying to help out the world, but the way you are doing it is currently wrong. And so you need to find a different way. You need to find a better way to actually help out the world. But first, you need to tell the police what you have been doing up in these woods, killing off people left and right. And maybe they might try to, you know, give you a short sentence. But once you are out, then you must work on being a better person. And this ends the first story we're going to cover in today's video, because the next two chapters is really more about Dazzler fighting against the Juggernaut. And so then we jump into Uncanny X-Men number 217. Now when we do, we pick up with the new members of the X-Men currently training on Mirror Island. Now when it comes to the new X-Men, we do have to talk about a few different things. The first is that Dazzler. Dazzler been on her own for a very long time. Matter of fact, ever since she first appeared in Marvel Comics, she was just over there. She was a mutant, she knew about the X-Men, she had worked alongside with them, but never truly had been a part of the team until Uncanny X-Men number 213, really 13 and 14, and we have skipped over 14. And the reason why, because in that storyline, a character known as Malice had taken over her body and was up to the X-Men to stop her. Now, once the X-Men had stopped her, she had joined their team. But the problem is though, she feels like she's not good enough to be on the team, but at the same time, there's still some bad blood between her and Rogue. Because in the early days of Rogue's appearances in Marvel Comics, she was the bad guy. She fought against the Avengers, but also fought against the X-Men. And so even though she's good now, Dazzler still remembers the days where she had fought against Rogue. But on top of that, she still feels like she's not able to be part of the ranks of the X-Men. Now, Psylocke, she's also trying to fit in because she's still learning how to use her powers in a more attack and defense kind of ways. And so right now, it's all really new for most of the new members, except possibly Longshot and Rogue. But at the end of their training session, you didn't have Banshee say, hey, come inside, it's time for breakfast. We didn't see Callisto having a conversation with Mormon Tagger, and this is a way to remind us about the Mutant Massacre storyline. Because remember, the Mutant Massacre storyline was about the idea that the Morlocks were being hunted down by the Marauders. Now, most of the Morlocks, they were killed off, but some were saved, but they were seriously injured. And so they were also brought over to Mir Island as a way to get healed up. And so you have more going over to Callisto to talk about the idea of how the Morlocks are doing because she is their leader. Now this leads into a small battle between Callisto and also Dazzler. And the reason why, because Callisto wants Dazzler to realize that 
she cannot just get by by her looks, that she has to learn how to fight because now she's part of the X-Men and that is a very huge thing. You're going to run into different kinds of battles and you need to have a better understanding how everything works. Now when it comes to Dazzler, it makes sense because she has been on her own for many years. And I'm not saying that she didn't have any kind of big adventures, but a lot of things she has done were not as big as what the X-Men had done over here. And so for her on the X-Men, she has to learn how to actually fight now and work with a team. And that is really important. But also for a long time, Dazzler was a pop star for many years in Marvel Comics because the world had no idea that she was a mutant. But when the world found out she was a mutant and when the world began to hate mutants even more, she had no choice but to find a way to perform in different kind of ways until she was unable to perform. And so now it's Dazzler realizing that her entire life has completely changed and fighting against Callisto did not help as well because now she's being constantly reminded that she needs to learn how to fight with the X-Men, how to be a better fighter. And so with it all happening in the training session, you have her leave and go into town wanting some alone time. And this leads into her battle against Juggernaut. And what I mean by that is, while you have Dazzler in town trying to just chill out, well, that is the moment she sees Juggernaut drive by. When he does drive by, she goes to chase him down because she knows that he's a well-known bad guy. And usually, if he's around, he's about to cause some problems somewhere. And so, she goes out of her way to try to stop him. Now, this is the Juggernaut. We have seen literally different members of the X-Men up to this point struggle to fight against him. And like I said, Dazzler is new to the X-Men. And yes, she has been fighting other bad guys in the past, but nobody like the Juggernaut. And so this is a whole new kind of challenge for her. Now at first, when it comes to Juggernaut, he said, listen, I'm here to do a job but I'm not here to hurt you. Now, the reason why he doesn't want to hurt her because he is a huge fan of her music. He's all like, listen, you are a great artist. I want to make sure you and I have a good connection, a good bond, and we can go our separate ways. But for Dazzler, she knows that he's a bad guy, that he's up to something. And so she tries to use her powers against him. Now, her powers don't really do much to Juggernaut. I mean, yes, she can blind him for a short period of time, but that's really it. And so she keeps trying to push herself over and over and over again. On top of that, she did get hurt in their battle. And so at the tail end of this chapter, it does look like she had possibly died in the arms of Juggernaut. And he was not trying to kill her. He was all like, listen, just leave me alone. I'm a huge fan and I want to make sure nothing happened to you. But she kept trying to go after him to make sure that he could not cause any problems. But because she pushed herself so much, we're left to believe that Dazzler had died in the arms of Juggernaut. But then we jump over to Uncanny X-Men number 218, where we do pick up with Polaris and Havoc. And matter of fact, they're going through a particular moment right now where they almost get run off the road. But the reason why they're here now, because this begins the process of possibly bringing these characters over to the team again. Because after Chris Claremont had taken over the X-Men, his main goal was to kind of push away the old characters and bring in the new characters. And so when it came to Havoc and Polaris, they were one of the first two to basically leave the team right after Claremont brought in the new X-Men. Now they would stay around for different storylines here and there, but most of the time they kind of stayed on their own. Now when it comes to the two characters, like I said, this is going to begin the process of the possibility of them rejoining the X-Men once again. And so that leads us back over to Dazzler. Now when it comes to Dazzler, as we saw at the end of the last chapter, 
we were left to believe that she had possibly died. Now, we already know she didn't die. Matter of fact, she was buried alive because Juggernaut believed that she had died. But now, with her being buried alive, there is a possibility that she might die now. Except, she does not. And the reason why, because the X-Men were able to find her. Because, let's not forget, she did try to go into the city to have a good time to clear her mind. And when she did that, somebody saw Saw her leaving and chase after the juggernaut and so because of that he was able to call over to the x-men and say hey your friend disappeared and try to go after the juggernaut and i have no idea what happened to her and so the x-men began to search for her which they were able to find her very easily and unbury her but now this is the x-men saying what is wrong with you because thing is we are supposed to be a team we should be working together. And so this is kind of like the moment where Dazzler realized that no matter what, this is her life. She's part of the X-Men and she has no choice but to go ahead and work with this team and try to adjust to her new life. Now that is the moment you have the X-Men get a call over the radio about Juggernaut currently attacking the city. And so you have our new X-Men here say, we should go and possibly deal with that problem. And so that leads into our four heroes working together to fight against the Juggernaut. Now, this is really huge. And the reason why, because this is the first time you have these four characters working together. That's really huge right there, because these four characters are all mostly new to the X-Men team. Rogue, not really, but the other three, yeah, most definitely new. Psylocke, she had been around for a while, but she was more of a reserve member. The other two, they are freshmen on the team. And so they have to learn how to fight alongside with Rogue and Psylocke. But either way, it's still kind of cool to see the four heroes come together to actually defeat the Juggernaut. Now, once they're able to do that, they get word that this entire time was Juggernaut just trying to keep them busy long enough so that Black Tom would be able to rob a bank. And so for our heroes, they're kind of upset about the idea they fail for the whole keep the superheroes busy long enough so somebody else can do something else over there. And so they're saying, listen, even though we failed to technically save the day when it comes to Black Tom, at least we were able to work together and take down a powerful threat. And so this is why I kind of want to cover this storyline right here to kind of tell you guys the X-Men team is going to get reshuffled. You're going to have some old folks are gone and new folks come in. But then we have to jump back over to Havoc and Polaris. Now, when we do, you have our two heroes going out of their way to check in on some campers at a camping site. Except when they get there, they kind of find out all the campers have been killed off. All their equipment has been ruined. And the question is right now, what happened to the campers? And we come to find out they were killed off by an alien race known as the Brood. And the only reason why we know that because the Brood used special kind of creatures as a way to travel across the universe. And that special kind of creature is here right now dead on Earth, which means the Brood had used this creature to come to Earth and the Brood are a very nasty kind of aliens that could cause a lot of problems for our heroes. But this is where we are going to end today. Now, this storyline does pick up where our last Uncanny X-Men video left off at. And remember, when it came to the ending of our last video, Havoc and Polaris found a ship that belonged to the alien race known as the Brood, this very nasty insect race. Now, when it comes to the Brood, the X-Men usually have a hard time dealing with them, but this time they're on Earth, and it could possibly lead to the end of the human race. And so for Havoc, 
Havoc, he says he has to warn the X-Men about the brood. The problem is, when he tries to call the X-Men, nobody is answering. And so he flies over to the mansion. Now, he also knows that around this time, Charles Xavier has stepped down as the headmaster of the school and Magneto took over. And so technically, Magneto is now the leader of the X-Men. But when he does arrive, he can't find anyone at first, but then he does find the X-Men, except they all appear somewhat creepy, and they begin to surround him, and they begin to do different things to him, like, for example, Rogue takes his powers away, and you have Psylocke begin to play with his mind, and so you're left to believe at first that Havoc may have run to the X-Men who are now being controlled by the Brood. And this could be a very horrible thing. But either way, Havoc does pass out. But then you have Havoc wake up, and we kind of find out what we just saw was a dream. Now, when he does wake up, he is confronted by his girlfriend Polaris, of course, the daughter of Magneto. Now, when it comes to their conversation, we get the chance to learn that Havoc did go over to the mansion to check up on the X-Men, and when he arrived, everything was okay. Except when he came back home, that was when he began to have that dream over and over and over again and so we're left to wonder maybe the x-men did something to his mind only because every single time he has that dream the dream only gets worse and so he feels like the dream is trying to tell him something and so he tells polaris i have to go back over there to just double check to make sure that the x-men are truly okay and so polaris says go ahead and go and he leaves now while he does leave you do see in the far distance the marauders are watching polaris because she is their next target now remember the marauders are a group of mutants who love the idea of killing off other mutants but we have no idea who the marauders are are truly working for but either way they're getting ready to attack polaris now while you do have havoc arrive at the mansion he realized it is abandoned now he does look around for some clues and he does find magneto's diary to kind of learn what the x-men have been up to now while reading it well back at home polaris is being attacked by the marauders now polaris is a very powerful mutant not really up there with her father magneto but still powerful but she's fighting against three or four marauders. It's not a fair battle for her. And so unfortunately, she's just trying her best to hold off against them. And also, Sabretooth is there. And guys, back in the early days of Marvel Comics, Sabretooth was ruthless. And so Home was all like, I don't care who you are or what power you have. I will just keep coming after you over and over and over again. So get ready to possibly die. Now, thanks to Magneto's diary, when it comes to Havoc, he was able to learn that recently Magneto has joined forces with the Hellfire Club. Now, we already saw that back in our New Mutant video. And so because of that storyline, we know that it's really more of Magneto trying to help out the school in different kinds of ways to also help out the mutant race. Now, once you have Havoc arrive, we also get reminded that Magneto is pretending to be the older cousin of Charles Xavier who had taken over the school, trying to hide his true secret identity from some people. Because some folks know that he is Magneto, and to other people, he's just the older cousin of Charles Xavier. Either way, when he does arrive at the Hellfire Club, he does confront Magneto, wanting to know what happened to the X-Men. But when it comes to Magneto, he's not trying to share that information. He just says, listen, the X-Men are okay, they're somewhere else, and I can't tell you, but if you have a message, go ahead and give it to me, and I'll give it to them. But Havoc still does not trust Magneto, because for many years in X-Men comics, he was their number one bad guy. Havoc had fought against Magneto a couple times, and so the idea of seeing him now a good guy is still hard to get used to. But either way, you have Magneto say, 
you don't realize what's happening right now around the world. And he's right. You have all these new kind of groups popping up left and right. X Factor, the Marauders, and more to come very soon. And so it's Magneto saying, dude, just chill and try to tell me what you want to tell me. But Havoc says no, and he walks away. Now, you do have Havoc call up Mirror Island, and you would think, yeah, the X-Men are over there because the last time we saw them, they were at Mirror Island getting some training done, but allowing different members of their team to actually get healed up. And so Havoc calls over there to only have the phone be answered by Callisto, one of the members of the Morlocks, and she says, no, the X-Men are back in New York. Go talk to Magneto, and he'll help you get a hold of the X-Men. But Havoc already tried that and failed. And so he said, fine, you know what? What about Cyclops? Do you know where I can find my brother? Now, when it comes to Callisto, she's very rude. And she tells Havoc, listen, man, if you want to find your brother, look in the yellow pages and just hangs the phone up on him. Now, when we jump back over to Polaris, She's still fighting against the Marauders, and she is struggling, but she's trying her best. And that is why I say, like, it's not a fair battle for her. You are talking about the idea of four or five different members of the Marauders coming after her at once. And on top of that, they were able to ambush her. She had no time to get properly prepared. And so, unfortunately, we're left to wonder, will she die or possibly get away? But we have to jump back over to Havoc, who is currently following Magneto. He is the only person who may know where the X-Men truly are. And so while you have Havoc following Magneto, they go into the subway tunnels. Now, every single step Magneto takes to make sure that no one is following him, Havoc is doing a good job hiding, and Havoc is also being able to find every single kind of secret door to continue to follow Magneto. But once he's able to get down to the lowest part of the subway tunnels, he does find the X-Men. And the problem is though, the X-Men are talking about the idea of disappearing. Now the reason why? because of the Marauders. And let me explain. Back in the Mutant Massacre storyline, the Marauders' main goal at first was to go after the Morlocks. At the end of that storyline, Sabretooth did arrive at the X-Mansion and began to attack the different members of the X-Men. And so the Storm, she's kind of worried about the idea of the Marauders trying to come back to finish the job because half their team is injured. Colossus, Nightcrawler, Shadowcat, the other half are still new. The only two members of the team who are technically, you know, veterans are Wolverine and Storm. And so they're saying we have to disappear. We have to make sure the world believes that we are truly dead until our team can one, get trained up, but two, our team can get completely healed up as well. And Havoc cannot believe what he is hearing, except out of nowhere, someone begins to grab him from behind, which he does freak out and begin to fight against the X-Men. Now, once you have both sides being able to calm down, really thanks to Psylocke, we kind of find out that at the very beginning of this storyline, when it came to Havoc arriving at the mansion, they mind wiped him because back then they were already plotting the idea of disappearing to make sure the world had truly forgotten about them. And so when it came to Havoc walking in, they were like, hey, we got to make sure he also thinks we're dead or forgets about us because when he hears the news we're dead he will possibly just move on with his life but now he's back here because Psylocke is still somewhat learning how to use her powers but on top of that Havoc was part of the X-Men Charles taught Havoc how to fight against psychic attacks like Psylocke and so he was able to remember to only come back here to this point but you have Storm say listen we have a lot going on right now currently and we felt like to protect you but to also protect our plan we made you forget and Havoc says that's not fair because I was an X-Men before you were and he's right because right after the original five it was Polaris and Havoc and then you have the new X-Men team come in and so for Havoc he says I have the right 
to be part of the X-Men no matter what and know what's going on with the X-Men no matter what. And so if you guys are going through something, then let me rejoin the team. And you have Magneto say, fine, if you're going to, you need to understand that right now, the world is having a lot of problems and those problems are affecting the mutant race left and right. And so if you're going to join us, just know you are about to go down a dark path. But to end today's video, we jump back over to Polaris. Now, when it comes to Polaris, she's still fighting against the Marauders. Unfortunately, she does lose the battle to the Marauders, or really their fifth member who arrives a tad bit late, and that would be Malice. And remember, Malice has the ability to possess your body, and so currently she is possessing the body of Polaris. And now it seems like Polaris will be forced to work alongside the Marauders. But this is What's going on there, YouTube, and welcome back to another comic book video. All right, so we're going to continue our coverage over X-Men comics as we work our way up to the Fall of the Mutant storyline. Now, the next book we have to cover is Fantastic Four vs. X-Men. Now, when it comes to this crossover, it's really interesting because this was the first step of Chris Claremont removing Kitty Pride from the X-Men. Let me explain. So, when it came to the Fall all of the mutants era of X-Men comics, Chris Claremont felt like it was about time to get rid of some old characters to bring in some new characters. And matter of fact, when it came to the X-Men at this point, they already gained three new members, Dazzler, Psylocke, and Longshot. Now, when it comes to Kitty Pride, yes, she would no longer be part of the X-Men, but should be able to join a brand new team coming down the road, better known as Excalibur. And so this was just a building block to get to that point right there to introduce another X-Men book. Now, with that being said, remember, when it came to Kitty Pride, she got seriously injured to the point where she is unable to turn off her phasing ability. Now, that's a huge problem, and the reason why, because sooner or later, she is going to completely disappear. Her molecules are breaking apart, and so the X-Men must find a way to save her by turning off her phasing ability before she no longer exists. And so getting into today's video, we do pick up with Franklin Richards' having a nightmare. Now, when it comes to Franklin, in this nightmare, he sees his father, Reed Richards, being the reason why both the X-Men and the Fantastic Four are both dead. Now, we're not told how they died, but apparently Reed is responsible, and apparently he knew a day like this would come. Now, here's the thing. Because you have Franklin try his best to stop his father from doing something that could technically turn him completely evil. But to Reed, he tells Franklin, no son, you cannot stop me. Nobody can stop me. Like I said, I knew this day would have come sooner or later. And so you have Reed pick up a book. Now this book is actually his old college journal. But apparently Reed ever since then, knew a day like this would come. Now, as soon as Reed picks up the book and he opens it, a beam of light shoots out of it and begins the process of turning Reed into Dr. Doom to say that down the road, possibly, Reed is going to be the reason why the X-Men and the Fantastic Four die. And if that does happen, there's a possibility that Reed might become the next Dr. Doom. Now, like I said though, that was a dream. So you do have Franklin wake up, but he wakes up scared and he wants to be comfort. And so he goes over to Reed. Now, like every almost classic Fantastic Four book, when it comes to Reed being in his lab, he somewhat, not really somewhat, he does ignore his family. And so you have Franklin coming to his father 
looking to be comfort and you have Reese say, hey man, sorry, I'm busy. Go find your mom. Matter of fact, I'll call her and tell her to take care of you. And so he does that. And so you have Susan take over for Reese. And you have Franklin tell Susan what he saw in that nightmare. Now for Susan, she's kind of like, dude, it's a nightmare. Calm down. You know what? Everyone has weird dreams. Don't worry. Those dreams will not come to life. Except you have Susan going through some old boxes. And she finds Reed Richards' old college journal. And as soon as she shows Franklin, he begins to freak out. Because in his dream, he saw that book be the reason why his father turned into Dr. Doom. Now, when it comes to the X-Men, well, they are currently at Mirror Island with Maura McTaggart and also Magneto as they try to find some kind of way to save the life of Kitty Pride. And so they're wondering what they can do before the possibility of Kitty no longer being around. But while you have the team just hanging out outside or inside trying to find different ways to save Kitty Pride, well, that is the moment where you have Magneto contact the entire team because apparently he got word that Reed Richards might have some kind of device that could really help out Kitty Pride. And so you have Magneto say, hey, I'm going to call up Reed Richards. Now for the X-Men, they're kind of concerned, will the Fantastic Four come? Because Magneto used to be a bad guy for a very long time in X-Men comics, only recently being turned into a good guy. And so to the rest of the world, they still look at him as a villain. And so the X-Men are very worried that Reed might say no because of Magneto. We then jump over to Dazzler and also Longshot because right now they're in the middle of the ocean trying to find a missing fisherman. And honestly, it does not take them that long to find him, except this missing fisherman is going to be very important for the next chapter of this story. But getting back over to the Fantastic Four, you have Reed wanting to spend some time with Susan, except when he tries to, you know, be that good old husband, well, she turns around angry at him because she read his college journal and what she read could possibly bring the end to the Fantastic Four. We did jump over to She-Hulk. Now remember, around this time, She-Hulk was part of the Fantastic Four. Honestly, I would say the Fantastic Five because you have Ben Grimm, you have the Human Torch, you have She-Hulk, you have Susan, you have Reed, like you have five people on a four person team. Either way, let's not forget, She-Hulk is a lawyer and currently she's working on something when it comes to Magneto. That right there is not really important because while she's working on that case, well, she is confronted by Ben Grimm. And you have the two characters have a conversation about how they feel about Magneto. When it comes to She-Hulk, she feels like everybody deserves a second chance. And when it comes to Magneto now being part of the X-Men, there's a good chance that he's actually good. Except for Ben Grimm, he believes that no bad guy will actually turn good. They always stay evil no matter what. And so for him, he says he can never trust Magneto at all, no matter what Magneto does to show that he is a good guy. Now, while you have the two characters talking to one another, they do hear a loud explosion and a building is falling apart. And so you have She-Hulk and Ben Grimm try to save the day. Now, you also have Magneto appear as well, alongside with the Human Torch. And you have all four characters work together to save this building. Now, here's the thing, because now with Ben Graham seeing Magneto in action, it's him kind of beginning the process of looking at Magneto in a better way. Either way, once you have our heroes being able to save the building, they do ask Magneto, why are you here? He says he needs to talk to Reed Richards. 
And so we do see our heroes go back over to the Baxter building. Now, when they do arrive, you do have Magneto asking Reed for his help to hopefully use his new device to save the life of Kitty Pride. Now, here's the thing. Reed, he does say yes, but he does look depressed. And the reason why? Because he's currently arguing with his wife, Susan, about what she had read in that journal. But here's the thing, because whatever happened in that journal begins the process of putting doubt in the mind of Reed Richards. And that's not normal, because when it comes to science, Reed is very confident about almost anything in science. But now, he's beginning to have doubts about his invention being able to help out Kitty Pride. And so even though he does say yes, he's kind of like, it's going to fail possibly. Now, Susan does not go with the Fantastic Four because, well, she's upset with her husband, but somebody got to take care of Franklin. Now, on their way over to Mir Island, you have the other members of the Fantastic Four realize there's something wrong with Reed. But the question is, what? And so you have Ben ask Reed, hey, dude, are you okay? Now, you have Reed tell Ben, yeah, not really, because I'm having doubt that my device can actually help out Kitty Pride to save her life. Now, you have been tell Reed, why are you having doubt? Like, dude, almost every single time when it comes to science, you are always right, except one time. And of course, that would be the cosmic rays. Now, as soon as Reed hears that, it kind of tells us that whatever was written in that journal that ticked off Susan had to be about the cosmic rays that gave our heroes their abilities, that made them the Fantastic Four. And so because of that, he's now having doubt right now if he is able to save the life of Kitty Pride. Either way, they do arrive to Mir Island. But right after they do arrive to Mir Island, you have Reed tell everyone there that he is sorry. And they're kind of like, sorry about what? And Reed says, I cannot help you. I cannot do this. My device is not going to work. Sorry for wasting your time. Now, when it comes to the X-Men, they get very upset because they're wondering, then what's the point of you being here? You came all the way out here with your device to help us, and now you're telling us you can't? Now, Reed does not tell our heroes why he cannot help them. It's just him saying, no, I cannot do it because he feels like his device might actually kill off Kitty Pride. Either way, you have the X-Men get very ticked off, especially Wolverine, who wants some answers, who begins the battle between the two teams. And so as we dive into the second chapter, well, we pick up with Wolverine attacking Reed. We are now getting Fantastic Four versus the X-Men. Now, here's the thing though, guys, because all of this could have had been avoided if Wolverine had just sat down and tried to talk to Reed and figure out why Reed no longer wants to help out the X-Men instead of trying to attack Reed. And so with Wolverine attacking Reed, well, Ben Grimm, the Human Torch, and also She-Hulk, they're kind of like, hey, you can attack our man like that. Now we have to jump you. And so while you have those people trying to jump Wolverine, you have the rest of the X-Men want to fight against the Fantastic Four as well as a way to protect Wolverine. And so it's kind of like, oh my God, Wolverine, this is all your fault. This whole fight is all your fault because you could not sit down and actually talk to people. Now, as the fighting goes on, Storm, she does get burned by the Human Torch. And that burn is somewhat important for this story arc. You also have Rogue being able to use her abilities to absorb the powers of Ben Grimm. And so now Rogue is technically a she-thing. But either way, Psylocke arrives and she realizes all of this mess is because of Wolverine being a hothead. 
Now, there is something I want to talk about, and that would be Franklin Richards. See, around his time, he had the ability to project himself in other locations as long as he was asleep. It was kind of like a psychic projection. Either way, when he does that, he is able to kind of be there, but no one else noticed that he is actually there. And so while you had the X-Men and the Fantastic Four fighting against one another, he had once again project himself over to the island to only see the two teams fighting against each other. And that scared him. And the reason why? Because of his first dream, the idea of his father turning evil. And he feels like that battle right there is the first step of his first dream actually happening. And so when he wakes up and he cries out for his mom, you do have Susan doing a great job trying to comfort her son. But when he tells her everything he saw on Mere Island, thanks to his, again, psychic projection well she's kind of like this is all Reed's fault because now it seems like one our child is having a hard time but two what she had read in that journal could lead to the end of the Fantastic Four now we have to jump over to Longshot, Dazzler, and also Havoc because they're also on Mere Island but they're inside the actual lab because remember, earlier Dazzler and Longshot went out of their way to find a missing fisherman. And so they're trying to see if he is going to survive. Except you have Havoc tell them, hey, the rest of the team right now is fighting against the Fantastic Four. What in the world is going on? We have to go help out our team. And so they leave. But as soon as they leave, the man they saved earlier wakes up. Except we kind of find out it's not a man, it's some kind of machine. And he's all like, okay, it's now time for me to begin my plan. But getting back outside, you do have Mormon Tagger and also Storm being able to calm both sides down. They kind of say, Wolverine, this is all your fault. The reason why both teams are fighting against each other, because you're being a hothead. Now, once both sides do calm down, you have Storm ask Reed once again, please, can you help us out? Can you save Kitty Pryde's life? And he says no, because again, he's now beginning to doubt himself as a scientist. Now, right after he says that, you then have that robot man comes out and that robot man begin to change into some kind of projector because this robot belongs to Dr. Doom. And so with the robot now being a projector, it begins to project Dr. Doom, allowing him to have a conversation with the Fantastic Four and the X-Men. Now, when it comes to Dr. Doom, he says, listen, I just got word that you guys need someone to help you out with your Kitty Pride problem. What if I tell you guys I have a machine that's very similar to Reed Richards' machine? What if my machine can actually help her? Now for our heroes, they are quick to say yes. We will go to you for help. Now, when it comes to the Fantastic Four, they tell the X-Men, hey guys, don't do that. Because even if he does help you out, you are going to be in his debt. And I'm telling you right now, you are going to hate working for that man or working with that man. But for our heroes, the X-Men, they don't care because again, Kitty Pride is on the verge of actually dying. And so right now, they're down to do almost anything to save her life. And so even though you have Reed just saying over and over again, the X-Men are not listening. And matter of fact, you have Mormon Tiger tell Reed, this is my island and you failed us. So go ahead and go right now. And you have Reed and the Fantastic Four having no choice but to go ahead and leave and watch the X-Men accept Doctor Doom's offer. And so we do jump back over to the Fantastic Four at the Baxter building. Now, this is them having a family meeting. And this meeting is not really a good one. And the reason why, because when it comes to the rest of the team, they have now all read what was in the journal 
of Reed Richards. And we kind of find out it has to deal with the idea of their origin. Let me explain. So when Stan Lee wrote the Fantastic Four, our heroes were going to travel in space. And he told his team, my rocket should protect us from the cosmic rays. We already know that was actually incorrect. They were hit by the cosmic rays and they became the Fantastic Four. Well, and this what could be a retcon, Reed knew the entire time what was going to happen to him and his team. And matter of fact, he intended for him and his team to get hit with the cosmic rays. And here's the reason why. Because Reed did a lot of studying over human evolution. He wanted to know what would come next for the human race. Now he did read over a lot of papers that were written by Charles Xavier that basically stated the next step was going to be mutants. And that was a huge thing for Reed. He wanted to prove that was not going to be the only next step of evolution for the human race. There could be many different ways that humans may evolve. And that is where cosmic rays got involved. He wanted to prove that cosmic rays could possibly help humans evolve as well. And so when it came to Stan Lee's origin for the Fantastic Four, it's now saying, no, that is wrong. Instead, Reed knew what would happen. He intended for him and the rest of his team to gain powers, to use them as proof as there is another way for humans to evolve. And this is a huge retcon, except you have Reed trying to state that he didn't write this. If he did, he does not remember. But the rest of the team, they don't believe him. They're kind of like, nah, man, you knew. You hid that secret from us, and that's messed up. And so it does seem like to be the end of the Fantastic Four. And so as we dive into the third chapter, we do pick up with the X-Men now in Latveria. Now, while being there, you do have Dr. Doom trying to help out Kitty Pride, but first, he must help out Storm. And the reason why? Because Dr. Doom has a huge crush on her. When it comes to Dr. Doom, he has a lot of respect for Storm to the point where he has been trying to get with her for a very long time. Matter of fact, in one of her first appearances in X-Men comics, the X-Men came over to Latveria and even then Storm was all like, hmm, Dr. Doom seems to like me. And he was kind of like, yo, I really do like her and I want her by my side. And so currently you have him just trying to fix up her burn wound that she had received from the Human Torch in the last chapter. But we have to shift our focus over to Kitty Pride because remember, this entire storyline is about Doctor Doom trying to help her and turn off her phasing ability. Either way, when it comes to Kitty Pride, she's at the point where she wants to commit suicide. She wants to go ahead and let her powers take her away. And the reason why? So the X-Men will not be in Dr. Doom's debt. And so she does begin the process of trying to kill herself off. Now, Franklin Richards is also there as well. Because remember, every single time he falls asleep, he is able to psychic project himself somewhere else in the world. And once again, he's doing it right next to Kitty Pride. But remember, nobody can usually see him. Only he can see the people around him in his projection form. And so he does see Kitty Pride about to commit suicide. And he tries his best to stop her to the point where he does wake up her pet dragon, which then warns the rest of the X-Men what she is trying to do. Now you have Psylocke trying to communicate with Kitty Pride with their minds, saying, hey, listen, don't do this. We're okay with Dr. Doom helping you. He can help you. He can save your life. Please don't kill yourself. But again, she does not want the X-Men to be in Dr. Doom's debt. Now, while she's about to commit suicide, Flake Franklin, almost said Flaken, Franklin Richards is able to yell out loud to the point where now 
other people can see his projection. And so he cries out to her to say, hey, please don't do this. Please stop. Like the X-Men are going to win. You're going to be healed. The Fantastic Four is not going to end. It's him crying and hoping that everything works out for both teams. And Kitty Pryde seeing him cry made her realize that it's most likely not a good idea to commit suicide in front of him, but at the same time, she kind of got hope thanks to Franklin because Franklin does believe that everything is going to work out. We do jump back over to the Baxter building, and the reason why, because we pick up with Reed Richards telling Gus that he does not believe what he has saw in his journal. Like, yes, it is basically written in a way that he usually writes, but he does not remember writing that. And so he's now beginning to have doubt about his own memory. He feels like maybe he did write this. Maybe he did plan to make the Fantastic Four. And when the rays hit him, he had possibly forgotten. It's him kind of wondering what is real and what is not real. Now he want to sit down and talk to his wife, but he can't. He feels like he broken her heart because again, he changed her life as well without her permission and so instead he goes to check in on his son who is currently going through something at the moment with the whole idea of him just seeing Kitty Pride about to commit suicide and so you have Reed being there for his son and being able to have a great father and son moment and while you have the two characters having this moment Susan sees the two hanging out, and that is when she realized, okay, I don't believe that Reed wrote that in his journal many years ago. Somebody else did, but the question is right now, who? But we jump over to Ben Grimm, who is currently moping around the city. Now, when it comes to Ben Grimm, the reason why is because he feels like his best friend purposely turned him into the thing and so for Ben Grimm he feels betrayed but also the idea that he has no one to love now for the hardcore fans out there when it comes to the Fantastic Four let's not forget around his time Alicia Masters was not dating Ben Grimm she was dating the Human Torch and so Homeboy has no one to love and he feels like he is a monster. Now, the only reason he's able to overcome these feelings is when he goes out of his way to save a young girl in a very bad car accident. And once he's able to save her, and you have the mom and the daughter show a lot of love towards him, he realized that even though he may look like a monster, the people don't look at him like that. They look at him as a hero. And so he is able to continue on. Now, the ending of the third chapter is really more the idea of the Fantastic Four coming back together as a team. You had every single member realize why they are part of this team, but also you have Reed Richards still having doubt about his device that could have been used to help out Kitty Pride because he feels like there's some errors when it came to his design. But he's now hoping that Dr. Doom will be able to overcome the errors that he had made to hopefully save Kitty Pride. But at least on the bright side, the Fantastic Four came back together. They all have forgiven Reed, but they all believe that Reed did not actually write that journal that somebody else did. But again, the question is who? Now, when we jump into the fourth chapter, we do pick up with Kitty Pride. Now, it's Kitty Pride just patiently waiting for Dr. Doom to do something that could possibly save her life. Now, that is the moment where she is confronted by Franklin Richards. And again, this is just him psychically projecting himself into the area now when it comes to franklin he does tell kitty pride the fantastic four are on their way to help her out that his father may have found a way to actually save her life now when it comes to franklin he also mentions the idea of his nightmare at the very beginning of this story because remember he believed the book 
that was found was going to lead into his father possibly turning into some kind of evil version of himself or become just as evil as Dr. Doom. And because the book has been found, it's Franklin saying I'm very worried about the idea of my father turning evil or possibly Dr. Doom winning. Either way, you have Kitty Pride and Franklin being able to kind of talk to each other to comfort each other because they're both going through different kinds of things. Now we do jump over to the Fantastic Four, who are right now using their jet to head over to Latveria. Now on their way there, you do have the Human Torch explain the origin of Reed Richards and Doctor Doom. Not completely, but to kind of give us the details of why Doctor Doom hates Reed so much. And we kind of find out that these two characters used to attend the same college. Except as soon as Reed had met Victor, they became rivals in different kinds of ways. Now for Reed, I won't say really he looked at Victor as a rival. It was more that he kind of respected Doom because how smart Dr. Doom was. And matter of fact, wanted to be his friend. But for Victor, it was more of, no, I don't like you. I don't like the idea of someone being as smart as me. And so again, the two became rivals. Now there was a project that Dr. Doom was working on and Reed tried to tell Doom that he had made a few mistakes. But because Doom believed that he was smarter than Reed, he ignored what Reed said. But unfortunately, Reed was right. And so Doom experiment fell apart. And so ever since that day, Dr. Doom had a bunch of bunch of hatred towards Reed Richards. We did jump over to Magneto and Storm. Now, this is the moment where you have the book kind of give us a quick reminder of something very important about Magneto. Because remember, around this time in Marvel Comics, he was the father to Scarlet Witch, Quicksilver and also Polaris, but around this time you have Magneto beginning to hint at the idea there was a fourth child who came before all three of them, except that child died. There was a fire at his home and unfortunately his powers were way weaker back then and so he was only able to save himself and his wife but unfortunately not his daughter Anya. And so she died in that burning building. And so ever since then, it really did bother Magneto a lot. Now, before he's able to explain more about his daughter, well, you have Dr. Doom project in front of him saying, listen, man, you are out here using your magnetic powers and that's ruining my whole entire experiment that could possibly save Kitty Pryde's life. So please stop using your powers until I am able to save your student's life. Now before we are able to move on, well that is the moment where you have the Fantastic Four appear. Now remember, the Fantastic Four is only here to help out the X-Men to see if Reed is able to actually fix the machine that he was trying to use originally to hopefully save Kitty Pryde's life. But the problem is though, the X-Men, they're on edge because the last time they saw the Fantastic Four, well, it was a battle. But on top of that, Reed let them down. And so you have the X-Men wondering why in the world are the Fantastic Four here for? Now, once again, it's thanks to certain members of the X-Men, Rogue and Wolverine, where it does lead into another battle. Because at first, when you do have the Fantastic Four land, you have Reed try to talk to Magneto about the idea of having another attempt at saving the life of Kitty Pride. But because Wolverine and Rogue are both hot-headed people, well, they begin to attack the Fantastic Four, who did try to defend themselves. Now, this fight does go on for a few pages until you have Franklin Richard stop everybody to say, guys, look at y'all. You are fighting each other, and right now, Kitty Pryde needs all of us to make it through. So please, Put your differences to the side and try to help one another to save her life. And so this leads into the moment where you have Reed explain 
what was wrong with his device and most likely what's wrong with also Dr. Doom's device. And we kind of find out that their devices are not made in a way to actually help Kitty Pride out. It could possibly make things worse for her. Because remember, right now, her molecules are breaking apart to the point where she might disappear completely. And so when it comes to their devices, well, it might actually make things a whole lot worse. Speed up the process. And so is Reed saying, dude, I realize what is wrong with your device because, again, is similar to mine except Reed cannot really explain what is actually wrong he's having a hard time trying to figure it out now this is what Dr. Doom wanted and what I mean by that is it technically tells us right here it was Dr. Doom who wrote that in Reed's journal just in case for a time like this where Reed will have doubt himself about how smart he truly is and so right now even though Reed realized what is wrong with Dr. Doom's advice? Reed cannot fix it though. And so is Dr. Doom saying, you know what, Reed? Go ahead and ask me, or we can have Psylocke probe your mind to get the answers we all need. And so for Reed, he hates the idea that it comes down to this moment right here. To reverse the effects of their machine on Kitty Pride, he might have to ask the help of Dr. Doom. But at the same time, he does not want to do that. He does not want to give Dr. Doom something that he may love. And so we see the X-Men freaking out because Kitty Pride is getting worse at a faster rate. You have everybody staring down Reed. You have Reed panicking and you have Dr. Doom just looking at Reed like, yes, I finally won. Except at the end of the book, a few hours later, we kind of find out they were able to reverse the effects of their machine. And now they have begun the proper healing process for Kitty Pride, Meaning that sooner or later, she should be able to go back to normal. Just like that. Literally, just like that. Now, you have Susan confront Dr. Doom. And the reason why, because she was able to realize that it was Dr. Doom who wrote in Reed's journal many years ago as a way to set up a moment like this. So Dr. Doom has been waiting for a moment like this for a very long time. And of course, it finally came. Now, the book really ends on that note right there. Kitty Pride is now in the process of being healed and most likely being a member of the X-Men are technically on her way out to join a new team. But with that being said, this is where What's going on there, YouTube, and welcome back to another comic book video. All right, so we are going to continue our coverage over X-Men comics as we work our way up to the fall of the mutant storyline. And we do pick up with Avengers vs. X-Men. This was the first time these two teams had fought against each other in a somewhat big event, a huge crossover. Now, this is also, I say personally, the trial of Magneto. And let me explain. So, when it came to Magneto in the early days of Marvel Comics, he was known as the most deadliest villain for the X-Men. But after Uncanny X-Men number 200, well, he turned into a good guy and actually replaced Charles Xavier. He became the headmaster of the school. He began to lead the X-Men. It was him trying to be a better person to actually help out the mutant race. But the problem is though, the rest of the world still looks at him as a villain. And so even though he has been doing a lot of great things here and there, unfortunately, the world still hates him. And so that's why I say this book is really more of the trial of Magneto. The main reason why you're going to have these two teams possibly fighting against each other. 
And so getting into today's storyline, we do pick up with the Avengers first. Now, around this time, the Avengers were Black Knight, Captain America, Captain Marvel, Monica Rambeau, Dr. Drood, She-Hulk, and also Thor. So a very unique group of members of the Avengers. Either way, when we do pick up with our heroes, they're trying to deal with a meteor shower. Different pieces of a meteor is about to crash into different populated areas of the world. And so you do have our heroes go out of their way to protect the United States. Now, the only reason why they're only protecting the United States because Black Knight basically tells us that when it came to his research, he realized the other pieces of the meteor that is going to fall in other countries like Russia or Australia should land in areas that are not really heavily populated. Matter of fact, there should be no one there at all. So those areas should be okay. But either way, you do have the Avengers come to this one small town, go to their Kmart actually, and try to protect the area from the pieces of the meteor. Now, once they're able to do that, they begin to kind of research or look over one piece of the meteor that had crashed on top of their Quinjet. Now, at first, they realize that the piece that crashed on the Quinjet is very heavy for She-Hulk to actually lift. Now, once they're able to lift it, they also realize it's very magnetic and wondering how in the world is this meteor heavily magnetic and so you have black knight being able to kind of cut off a piece of the meteor to only find metal that has been buried inside the actual meteor and the question is why why is there pieces of metal buried deep inside this piece of meteor but unfortunately for our heroes they have no idea where this meteor came from and why there's metal inside of it now we have to jump over to Russia. Now around this time, it wasn't really called Russia. It was called the Soviet Union. But either way, over there, you had another superhero team better known as the Soviet Super Soldiers. Now, of course, when you had the Soviet Union go away and turn into Russia, they then changed their name over to the Winter Guard. But at this time in Marvel Comics, they were known as the Super Soviet Union soldiers either way they're trying to deal with a different kind of problem see at a train yard you had a lot of trains being derailed causing a lot of problems here and there for our heroes to jump in and actually handled now when it comes to the soviet super soldiers around this time you had characters like vanguard ursa major dark star Crimson Dynamo, and the Titanium Man. Now, each of these characters are able to come together, but then you have the Crimson Dynamo say, the reason why all these different trains got derailed because a piece of the meteor flew by. For some reason, it had released a huge amount of electromagnetic pulse, which of course threw everything off. And so you have our heroes wondering what is currently going on with that piece of meteor. And so you have all the heroes leave to go research it. Now we have to jump over to Mir Island. And the reason why, because that is where the X-Men were staying around his time in Marvel Comics. Because remember, the mansion is technically no longer safe with the idea of marauders might possibly come after them. But on top of that, the X-Men have three team members who are currently injured, Nightcrawler, Shadowcat, and also Colossus. And so with those three friends on the sideline, and also with the idea of marauders looking for them, the X-Men had to come to Mir Island. They're also trying to trick the world into believing that they are dead. And so around this time with the X-Men, you have Storm, Wolverine, you have Dazzler, you have Rogue, you also have Longshot as well. Oh, and we cannot forget about Havoc, the brother to Cyclops. Now, like I said earlier, Magneto is also part of the X-Men because again, after Charles Xavier stepped down, Magneto took over. 
Now, while you have the X-Men trying to relax on Mir Island, they also have a TV nearby them. And this TV is technically talking about different news reports that are happening around the world about the different pieces of the meteor crashing in those different areas. But you do have all these different reports talking about the idea that these different pieces were all magnetic. Now, as soon as you have the reporter say that, you have Magneto realize, oh my God, it's my old base, Asteroid M. Now, the last time we saw Asteroid M, it was destroyed when Warlock was traveling over to Earth. And so for Magneto, he believed his old base was actually gone. But now, come to find out, it never was completely gone. And so those pieces are crashing all over the earth. Now it's Magneto saying he has to go around and find some certain pieces because of his own personal reasons. And so he just leaves without actually telling the X-Men. But Wolverine saw him leave. And so you have Wolverine tell the rest of the team, hey, Magneto just left and we have no idea why which possibly mean it could be him getting into some kind of trouble. Now you do have the X-Men realize that the recent news report is talking about the different pieces of the meteor, which of course was Asteroid M, his old base that was on a meteor. And so you have our heroes realize that if Magneto is out there searching for different pieces of his old base, it could possibly be a recipe for disaster. We then jump over to the Avengers. Now, when we do, it's really more of the Avengers telling us that they got word America, Russia, Australia, and also some other countries as well are all working together to go after Magneto. The news reports that he saw was actually used by these countries to bring him out into the open so that they can actually kill him. Because like I said at the very beginning of this video, Magneto was still looked at around his time as a bad guy, as a villain, even though he had joined the X-Men and tried to be a good guy to help out his people, the world still looks at him as a bad guy because he had committed a lot of crimes. He has killed off a lot of innocent people. And so these different countries are coming together to go after him, to ambush him and then assassinate him because they all knew if word got out that pieces of his old base is crashing around the world, he would be very intrigued to find those pieces. And so it made the perfect time to go after him. And so to the Avengers, this is a bad thing because the Avengers and us realize around his time in Marvel Comics, the world is beginning to turn against the mutant race even more, trying to make new laws in almost every country to possibly get rid of them. And so for the Avengers, they realize if they kill off Magneto, not them, but these three, four or five countries, it could really help people out there who truly hate mutants a lot to get more people on their side because Magneto was such an evil person. And so you have the Avengers say, we have to help him and also protect him. And so we do pick up with Magneto going to a certain location to see if he is able to find a piece of Asteroid M, except that is the moment where he is confronted by, well, the Avengers. Now, the Avengers are not just only here to protect him from being assassinated, but also here to say he deserves a fair trial. We're going to take him to a courthouse in front of a jury to give him a fair trial. But again, they first have to protect him. Now, as soon as they say that, the X-Men arrive as well. Now, the X-Men are only here because they were following Magneto. And so you have the Avengers trying their best to explain things over to the X-Men, except they get cut off again when you have the 
Soviet super soldier team arrive as well because we come to find out when all these different countries agreed to work together to go after Magneto they wanted to use this group right here who would be down to kill off Magneto. America realized they could not trust the Avengers to kill off someone. So why not go and get another group of heroes? Now when She-Hulk steps in front of everyone to protect them from the Soviet super soldiers, well that group right there took She-Hulk's move as a threat because also she is trying to protect Magneto. And so for them, it's kind of like you had just declared war against the Soviet Union. And because we're that team from there, you declare war against us. So now we're going to fight against you to get to Magneto. And so you now have a three-way battle for just one guy. And so as we dive into the second chapter, we do pick up with everyone fighting against each other. Well, honestly, that is not true because you do have the X-Men being able to sneak away while you have the Avengers fighting against the Soviet super soldiers. And so while those two groups are just battling it out, you have the X-Men just being able to grab Magneto and get on their Blackbird and fly away. So honestly, this is a great moment for the X-Men to regroup, but to also have a conversation with Magneto. But we also get the chance to see the other two teams, the Avengers and the Super Soviet Super Soldiers, go against each other and who would possibly win. I'm going to tell you right now, the Avengers win easily. Now, once you have the X-Men being able to regroup with one another, you do have Magneto kind of explain to the X-Men why he was trying to find the different pieces of Asteroid M. And we kind of find out that there is different kinds of equipment on the different pieces of the asteroid that could be used for evil things. And so he wants to make sure they don't fall into the wrong hands. Now I'm gonna tell you right off the bat, his main concern is that those kind of weapons could be used as a way to hunt down mutants. And because Magneto is trying to do a better job in protecting and helping mutants, he want to make sure the weapons that he had created is not used against his own people. Now, after telling the X-Men that, you have Magneto tell the X-Men this is something he must do on his own. And so he just leaves once again. And so you have Magneto being able to locate the original piece that he came looking for in this area. And once he's able to find that piece and begin to look around this piece of the asteroid, well, he begins to have flashbacks of the days where he was the main villain of the X-Men and all the different problems that he had caused. And so this is him hoping that once he's able to get rid of all these different kinds of dangerous weapons, but to also get rid of Asteroid M for shortest time, that he'll be able to bury the past where he was a villain. Now, unfortunately, while he is trying to get rid of this piece of Asteroid M, well, he's then confronted by the Avengers once again after they were able to defeat the Soviet super soldiers. And so it looks like we're about to get round two with the Avengers and Magneto. Now, luckily for Magneto, the X-Men had arrived to help him out. Even though the X-Men are kind of tired of him just running off and trying to deal with different problems on his own, he's still a mutant. He's still part of the X-Men. And Charles Xavier believes in Magneto. And so those three things is just good enough for them to actually help out once again. And so this time we do get the X-Men fighting against the Avengers, a full on battle. But here's the thing because when it came to Magneto finding that piece of the asteroid and being able to recover the different equipment from that piece of the asteroid, he has set up a bunch of charges to make sure the entire place 
blows up to make sure that any equipment that he may have left behind cannot be found. And so while you have the Avengers and the X-Men fighting against each other around this piece of Asteroid M, you have Magneto say, hey, we have to leave right now because that place right there is set to blow up. Now, the ending of the second chapter, we do see Magneto being able to put around the area a magnetic field to protect everyone who was near the piece of the asteroid M that was set to blow. And so with him doing that, everyone was able to survive the explosion. But the Avengers were completely knocked out. And so when they wake up, they realize the X-Men were able to sneak away once again, get back on the Blackbird, and now they can leave to possibly go back home. Except they have no idea that a member of the Avengers were able to sneak onto the Blackbird, and that would be Dr. Drood. And when it comes to Dr. Drood, he's using his psychic abilities to hide his appearance to hide him being there on the blackbird and so for the x-men they have no idea he is there but he is there to technically gather intel on why the x-men are trying to protect a war criminal but at the same time where the x-men are going and so as we dive into the third chapter we do pick up with the super soviet soldiers and this is them kind of getting back on their feet after being defeated by the avengers but they also realize the X-Men are gone and so is the Avengers. Now the X-Men are flying away in their black jet and you do have the Titanium Man being able to shoot a beam at the Blackbird the X-Men are currently using. Now it's not a powerful beam, it was very small, but that small damage to their jet is going to grow over time and sooner or later the X-Men are going to have to land their jet and find a different way to get around the world. To to get away from the Avengers and also away from the uh, Soviet super soldiers. Now that leads us over to the X-Men who still have no idea that Dr. Drood is currently on the Blackbird. And matter of fact, in the middle of their flight, you have Dr. Drood try to call up the rest of the Avengers to basically tell them, hey, I'm with the X-Men, they have no idea I'm here, and sooner or later I should be able to gather enough intel but also a location of where the X-Men are going. Except in the middle of that call to the Avengers with his psychic abilities, well, Magneto realized that Dr. Drood was on the jet. Because Magneto has a very powerful mind. His mind is well trained to protect itself against psychics like him. And so you have the X-Men say, okay, we have to drop him off somewhere else so that the Avengers cannot find us. But then you have Storm say, we have to land his jet very soon. Somebody did damage to our jet and that damage is only getting worse. And of course you already know that was the Titanium Man. And so the X-Men do land, but they make sure to drop off Dr. Drood somewhere else before they sneak away. And so we jump over to Singapore. Now the reason why, because the X-Men are hiding out here because this was the nearest location where they had to land their jet. And so Wolverine knows someone out here who could possibly give them a way to transport Magneto to a secure location. And so while you have our heroes just making sure there's no one following them and going their separate ways, we do pick up with Havoc. And you have Havoc currently being followed by a character known as Vanguard. Now Vanguard is part of the Soviet Super Soldiers group. And matter of fact, he is a mutant like his sister Darkstar. Now when it comes to Vanguard though, he has the ability of energy redirection, force field, energy projection and flight. So he could be a very powerful threat if he was able to use his powers correctly. And originally, he could only use his powers when it came to him holding his hammer and also another piece of item as he crossed his arms. And that was the only time he could access his powers until he finally learned how to use his powers. 
Either way, he was able to find Havoc, who was trying to hide in the crowds of Singapore. And so you have Vanguard trying his best to basically capture Havoc, but to only be stopped by Wolverine and Rogue. And that tells the X-Men they have to get the heck out of Singapore now, because now the Super Soviet soldiers are here, and they're about to try to capture the X-Men all over again. And so we do pick up with the X-Men currently on a boat heading towards a secure location. Now on their way there, you do have Wolverine tell Storm while Magneto is not there that he believes that Magneto is most likely hiding something because Magneto did go to one particular location to destroy just one piece of Asteroid M. Now all the equipment that was inside of there was also destroyed, but Magneto did pull out his helmet. What was so important about that helmet of his? And so it's Wolverine saying he feels like Magneto is still hiding something and we have no idea what it could possibly be. Now you do have Storm try to confront Magneto, but unfortunately you have Magneto tell Storm, I have to leave because you guys are actually innocent. I'm not. The Avengers and also the Super Soviet soldiers are only coming after you to get to me. If I leave you guys behind, then they will no longer come after you guys. Except the problem is they have arrived already and they are about to attack the X-Men on the boat to get to Magneto. Now, when it comes to the X-Men, they're not trying to attack the super Soviet soldiers because one, they're on a boat. And two, if the boat gets badly damaged, then most likely everyone would drown. Also, the innocent people who are on the boat who is just minding their business. And so you have the X-Men really trying this time to at least talk to the other group to hopefully get rid of them. But the problem is though, Crimson Dynamo is not trying to listen. And matter of fact, when Wolverine tries to stop him without actually attacking him, you have Crimson Dynamo go ahead and attack Wolverine, which means it leads into a battle between the X-Men and also the Soviet super soldiers. And this is a problem because they're on a boat. And so all their different kinds of attacks is just doing damage to the boat to begin the process of the boat sinking into the ocean. Now, luckily, the Avengers have arrived because the boat was calling out for help. And so you have the Avengers go out of their way to actually help the X-Men get all the innocent people off the boat, but to also get the Soviet super soldiers off the boat as well to save everybody. And it's kind of like, okay, the Avengers realize that the X-Men are not truly enemies it's this third party group right now who's just causing a lot of problems for no good reason. And matter of fact, once you have the fight being done and you have everyone being able to get off the boat, you didn't have the Avengers just go edit on Crimson Dynamo because it was his fault a battle even started on the boat because he was being hot-headed, looking for Magneto. Except then you have all three teams realize Magneto is no longer there, which means that he had disappeared before the fight had even happened. So where in the world did he go to? But before we are able to find out, well, we kind of find out that, well, the Avengers are going to arrest Crimson Dynamo because technically it was his fault that both basically sunk at the bottom of the ocean. And so he's getting arrested and will be taken away. But we come to find out that Magneto was able to sneak onto another boat that's currently going back to Singapore because apparently he's not done. He even says he has some unfinished business there to take care of and then everything should be okay. And so Homeboy was able to sneak onto another boat and pretend that he was there the entire time, even though we know he wasn't. And so as we dive into the fourth and final chapter, we do pick up with the Avengers 
paying a visit to the office of Mr. Ronalds. Mr. Ronalds is basically the leader of a special unit that was sent out by America to go out to Singapore and capture Magneto. And they're working alongside with the police force of Singapore to make sure Magneto does get captured. Now when it comes to the Avengers, they want to know what happened to the other two teams after the ending of the third chapter. And we kind of find out that the Soviet super soldiers went back home to Russia, but the X-Men are currently being held against their will. And the reason why, because one, they were helping Magneto escape law enforcement, but two, because they are mutants. Now, when it comes to our Avengers, they're like, you can't do that. But their conversation does get interrupted when Mr. Ronalds gets word that Magneto has been seen in Singapore. And that means his special force team is about to move in. Now when it comes to Magneto, he's still trying to be a good guy. Still trying to make sure that he does not go out of his way and harm people if he needs to get away from law enforcement. But unfortunately, out of nowhere, he is surrounded by that special force team that was sent there to capture him. And they try their best with all different kinds of weapons to capture him, but again, he's just too powerful of a mutant that he cannot be easily stopped. Now, while trying to get away, he is confronted by three other mutants, and that would be Lyco, Crawler, and Slider. Now, they belong to a particular group of mutants, but they were sent here to help Magneto get away. And of course, he does follow them. And so you have those three characters take Magneto over to a building that belongs to a new group of mutants better known as the Mutant Underground of Singapore. In this one particular building, you have different kinds of mutants hiding here because now you have humans in all different parts of Singapore beginning the process of going after mutants to just get rid of them. And matter of fact, we saw that other countries as well. The human race is gearing up to go to war against the mutant kind. Now, with all that being said, the leader of this group is a character known as Light. And Light has the ability to know when someone is telling the truth or not. And so when they want to make sure that Magneto is actually Magneto, they ask him to say, hey, say your name and say you are him. And when he does, Light says, you are telling the truth. Now, when it comes to Light, he reminds Magneto of his early days. He's somebody who still believes that the human race should be killed off as a way to kind of make way for the mutants because the mutants are being attacked by the humans too much now. It's time to get rid of the humans. It's time to attack them. Now, while you have Light giving out this speech, the base is actually attacked by that same special force team we saw earlier. Now they're here trying to capture Magneto, but now innocent mutants in this building are being hit left and right. Now, Magneto Magneto is able to use his powers to defend himself and the others, but it really does tick off Magneto a lot that no matter where he goes, his own people are getting hurt. Now, you do have Light and the other members tell Magneto to follow them as they go to their backup base. But when we jump back over to the X-Men, they are currently just sitting in custody minding their business. Now, here's the thing. When it came to the special force arresting the X-Men, they didn't make sure to give the X-Men some kind of special equipment that could cancel out their powers. So really, the X-Men could have escaped any time they wanted to. They were just hoping that they could do it in a more peaceful way. But unfortunately, the X-Men got tired of waiting, so they went ahead and busted out of their prison and left to hopefully find Magneto. And so you have Mr. Ronalds get very upset because the X-Men just broke free and he asked the Avengers to go follow them and the Avengers say no because it seems like you have a huge agenda against Magneto not because of his past crimes because he is a mutant. We then jump back over to Magneto, and when we do, we see him and Lyco and a few other members of the mutant underground of Singapore go to their backup base 
which is on a random boat. Now, I kind of want to focus on Lyco just real briefly. And the reason why, because Lyco has the mutant ability to find other mutants. That right there is going to be very important here in a moment. But you do have Lyco realize that Magneto is working on some kind of device. Now, this device, he has been hoping to use this for a very long time, but unfortunately, one person kept standing in his way, but that person is no longer on Earth. So now he has the ability to finish it and actually use it. And so once he does, we kind of find out he has the ability now to teleport people over to him. And so when the X-Men and the Avengers are confronting one another, Magneto is able to tap into the minds of both teams and say, hey, listen, I will bring you guys over to me. Matter of fact, I just want Captain America from the Avengers, but I want all of the X-Men to come here to me. And out of nowhere, those few people are teleported over to where Magneto was at. Now, we kind of find out what else the helmet could actually do. Matter of fact, the third and final ability is the most important one because we kind of find out it has the ability to access the mind of every single person on the planet. But then Magneto will have the ability to erase all the hatred that regular humans have towards the mutant race to hopefully finally bring peace to the entire world. Now, the reason why he could not use this in the past because of Charles Xavier being a very powerful psychic, that he would be able to block the helmet ability of doing that because Charles believes in free will, that they need to actually make the humans believe that mutants are not bad. We can't force them, we have to guide them into a better decision. And so when it comes to Magneto, he's kind of like, I'm down to use this. And the only reason why? Because of Lyco, this young girl who is a mutant, but now she's being hunted by humans no matter where she goes. And that's not fair. Young mutants deserve the right to grow up in a normal life. And that is very, very huge. But here's the thing. Magneto wants to use the helmet on Captain America to see that if he does use it, will Steve Rogers change his mind towards Magneto actually using the helmet on the rest of the people of Earth? Because he does tell Steve, I want to use it, but I feel like it's the wrong thing. And Steve says, yeah, because again, free will. So even though Magneto does use the helmet to hopefully erase any kind of hatred that Steve Rogers might have towards the mutants, which we're going to find out is completely 0%, Steve still says you cannot use that helmet because, again, free will. And so after that conversation, Magneto realized, okay, you know what? Steve is right. But on top of that, I'm tired being on the run. It's time for me to go ahead and face the charges that have been brought upon me. Now, this leads us into the court session where you have the trial of Magneto actually go on. And we already knew where this trial was going to go, where you have all these different people basically talking bad about Magneto. The trial is not going in its way at all. Now, when it comes to his lawyer, it's going to be Gabriella Haller. Now, Gabrielle Haller is very important because she's the mother to Legion. She is technically the baby mama to Charles Xavier. Either way, she is a great lawyer. But no matter what she's doing in this trial, they're losing. They are losing this battle big time. And Magneto realized what's currently happening at the moment. That no matter what she says, no matter what he says, no matter what even the witnesses say, Magneto is still being looked in a way as a bad guy. Even though he has turned good and begun the process of trying to do good things to overlook his bad things in the past, he's still being looked at as a villain. But here's the thing, Magneto did some 
horrible crimes in the past, killing off a lot of innocent people who were just involved because of his master plans against the human race. So even though he did some good things, well, his bad things are even worse, way worse than all the great things that he has done. But the trial does not go his way. And so now Magneto has to wait until they declare what is going to happen to him. And so with this break, you have Magneto think of a game plan. Now, before we dive into Magneto's plan, I kind of want to sit down and talk about what Magneto is thinking here. And what I mean by that is Magneto believes the Chief Justice Du Motier, the guy in charge of the entire trial, could possibly be a mutant. And the reason why Magneto believes that, because if Magneto goes to jail, that means the humans of the world would believe they have the right to go ahead and freely attack any mutants across the board, which could lead into a war, where then the mutants could use their abilities to defend themselves, to possibly erase the human race off the board. And so, it's Magneto saying the Chief Justice wants to use me to start a war so that mutants could finally have peace. But the problem is, there are going to be a lot of lives lost in that war down the road. That's a bad idea. And so you have Magneto call up Captain Marvel, Monica Rambeau, to go over to Singapore to find Lyco. And the reason why? Magneto wants to use Lyco ability, where again, she is able to see who, who is a mutant or not, use that ability to tell the world that the Chief Justice is a mutant and what his master plan is, and to hopefully have the trial be thrown out, but to also prevent a war. But to also show the human race that there are young mutants who will not have the chance to live a normal life because you humans want to go ahead and kill us off. That's not fair. And so he tells Marvel, go find her. She's the key to stop all of this mess. Except when Captain Marvel goes over to the base, to the underground mutant of Singapore, well, their base has been attacked. Because ever since Magneto got arrested, humans in Singapore got even crazier. They believe they have the right to do anything they want to mutants. That mutants do not have human laws to protect them. And so Lyco, she died. You're like, dang. And so Captain Marvel has to go back over to Magneto, but before she does that, she stops by Du Montier's office to listen in on his conversation to see if he is actually a mutant. And when she does stop by Motier's office, she begins to hear a conversation he's having with someone else about the idea of starting a war. Because again, the humans are really big on killing off the mutant race. If Magneto goes to jail, that war would actually start. Now, when it comes to Magneto, he was wrong about Du Matir. Matir is not a mutant. He's a human who wants the war to start so that humans could use their weapons to eradicate eradicate the mutant race. And so for Captain Marvel, she realized that Magneto was half right, but still half wrong. And so she goes back over to Magneto to tell him what she had learned. Now for Magneto, he realized what he has to do here. He says, you know what? I got this. And so he begins to call for his helmet. Now, let's not forget, his helmet has the ability to erase any kind of hatred in anyone's mind towards the mutant race. And so once the helmet comes to him, right before his sentencing is about to be stated, he used the helmet to erase any kind of hatred in the mind of Du Matir to hopefully change the outcome of the trial. Because once you have the trial come to the closing part, where it's time to see if Magneto is actually guilty or innocent, Motir says he is actually innocent. So all trials, all trials, sorry, all charges have been dropped. Magneto won the trial. He is happy like no other. But then he realized something. The other judges who were up there with Motir, 
did not say anything at all when it came to him saying Magneto is free to go. He believed that the other judges up there would throw a fit about the idea of letting Magneto go, but none of them did. And so that is when Magneto realized he just got played, basically. They were planning on releasing him so that the humans could build on the hatred of a mutant getting free of no charges, being able to walk away without going to jail, to basically say there's a possibility the entire actual trial was fixed, which technically it was now because of Magneto using that helmet. And so the story ends on that note because now it's Magneto saying, I could be the sole reason why the war between humans and hum or humans and mutants may have begun. And this is where we are going to end today's Okay, so we're going to continue our coverage over the Fall of the Mutant story arc. And we have to cover a Candy X-Men issues number 220 all the way up to 223. Now, this is going to be a three-part story arc where we do see the X-Men getting involved when it comes to the hunt for Madeline Pryor. Now, the reason why I say the hunt for Madeline Pryor is because because let's not forget, over in X Factor comics, Cyclops believes that his wife and his son are supposedly dead, but in reality, they're still alive. Well, we know Madeline is because we covered a video earlier where we saw her being attacked by the Marauders. Now, she was able to get away and she was taken over to a nearby hospital. And so now you have the Marauders getting word that one, she's still alive and two, she's now beginning to ask questions about what in the world had happened to her. And so now we know the Marauders are trying to chase after her and supposedly try to kill her but Scott Summers has no idea but when it comes to the X-Men well they're going to get involved when it comes to her being hunted down by the Marauders but before we are able to dive into that storyline we have to jump over to a candy x-men issue number 220 and the reason why because we pick up with storm about to leave the x-men just temporarily and the reason why because she wants to restore her powers because she lost her powers thanks to Forge. And so she is hoping that if she is able to find Forge, that he may have the ability to give her powers back over to her. And so her goal is to leave to go find him. But before she does leave, she has a conversation with Wolverine. And the reason why, because she wants to put him in charge of the team while she is gone. Now, when it comes to Wolverine, he honestly does not look at himself as a leader. And so with him thinking that, he says, no, I cannot lead the team while you are gone. Have somebody else do it. Why not Rogue? Now, here's the thing. Storm loves every single member of the X-Men, but when she looks at the team, she knows Wolverine is the veteran of the team. He's the best person to be left in charge of the team. Now, if he was not around, then yes, she would ask Rogue, but the rest of the team besides him and Rogue are basically new members. Psylocke, Dazzler, Logshot, these are new team members who are still learning how to be on the X-Men. And so for Storm, no, he is the best choice. And so she tells him, why did you think I came after you for? Why did you think I came here to talk to you for? Because no one else can lead the team. Only you can. And so he says yes. 
Now the story does jump forward four days and we pick up with Storm arriving at Eagle Plaza. Now remember, when it comes to Eagle Plaza, this was the research and development facility that was being run by Forge. And so this is why she came here for, to hopefully find Forge there. Except when she walks in, well, one, the power to the building has been cut off, Two, the phone lines are dead, which that makes sense. And three, all different kinds of security weapons are currently depowered as well. But she also realized the entire building is a complete mess. And that is not like Forge at all. And so when it comes to Storm, she realized something must have happened to Forge. But the question is, what? And so did on the rooftop of the building, we do pick up with a character known as Naze. Now Naze was the instructor to Forge many years ago. He taught Forge how to use magic. And the reason why? Because he was hoping that Forge would be the one to fight against a powerful demonic being. That's going to be very important for this storyline. But when it came to Forge, he was not really down with that idea. And so he left that life behind to go join the army. Now when it comes to days, he's apparently at the same building that Storm is at. Except he was currently doing some kind of ritual but in the middle of that out of nowhere well it seems like he was taken over by some demonic being and when it comes to this demonic being it realized that storm is also in the building and this mysterious being who has taken over the body of days is very happy about the idea of storm being there but shifting back over to Storm, you have Storm continuing to walk around the building. And while she is doing that, the power comes back on. Now when it does, you then have all these different kinds of holograms beginning to play different kinds of moments from the past when her and Forge were hanging out. Now, let me remind you guys, when it came to Forge and Storm, the last time these two characters met up, we saw the beginning of them two falling in love with one another. Matter of fact, it seemed like they did fall in love with one another. Now, even though Forge did take the powers of Storm away, she still has some kind of feelings for him and so all these different kind of holograms that are playing past moments of their love it makes her very upset but wondering why in the world did forge program these holograms to constantly play all these old memories but either way as she is walking around she then hears a loud scream and to her she thinks it's a female but when she goes into the other room she sees forge hooked up to some kind of machine. Now, at first, she does freak out, but then she realized, okay, this is a hologram. But then she is confronted by Naze. Now, when it comes to Naze, he tells uh, Storm, this was my doing. All the different holograms being turned on right now was for me to see how much you still love Forge, but to also test you as well to see if you were ready to actually help me out. Now, the reason why he's saying that because he taught Forge many years ago how to use magic to fight against a demonic being known as the Adversary. Now, like I said earlier, Forge did not stay behind to keep learning magic to fight against the demonic being. And so you have Nay saying, that was his downfall because now the adversary was able to take over the body of Forge and that is a huge problem. And so Storm, I need your help because you're the woman he loves. You're the woman who still loves him. I need your love and his love to help me save Forge, but to also have Forge use the magic I taught him to get rid of the adversary. Now, when it comes to Storm, She's not down with this idea at all because the only reason why she came here was to get her powers back. That was it. But now it's kind of like, hmm, 
If I want to get my powers back, I have to help out Forge. I have to save his life. Even though we had a real bad fallout, he is the only key to get my powers back. Now, you can also tell that Storm still has feelings for Forge. So even though she does hate him, she still loves him and realize it's the right thing to do to go and help him and so she agrees now when she walks away we see Nays give us a evil grin to tell us that hey this is not Nays at all that he was taken over but unfortunately now he has storm on his side to complete some kind of task the question is what is that task now, when we jump into Uncanny X-Men issue number 221, that is when we dive into the idea of the hunt of Madeline Pryor, because we also get our first appearance of Mr. Sinister. Yes, this was the first time anyone saw him in Marvel Comics, and this was the first time we learned that he was the leader of the Marauders, which means that when it came to the Mutant Massacre, it was him who had sent the team to go in the tunnels and begin the process of killing off the Morlocks. Either way, he's very upset with his team about the idea of not being able to kill off Madeline Pryor, because like I said earlier, she was able to get away from them and she went to the hospital and she's been there ever since the time we saw her a couple videos ago. And so now you have Sinister saying, you guys are going to finish the job this time. You will not fail at all. Please kill her off. Now, Sabretooth, this is hilarious. Sabretooth thinks, you know what? I don't know who you are talking to, but I am Sabretooth, and nobody can talk to me like that. Dude, Sinister did not care at all. He said, hush, you work for me. You are going to do what I ask you to do, which is find Madeline Pryor and kill her off. But then we jump over to the X-Men. Now, when we do, we pick up with Dazzler, who's currently in the Danger Room. Now, with her being inside the Danger Room training, well, her training program is her fighting against Rogue. And this is going to lead into a huge problem. And the reason why, because it's Dazzler really expressing the idea that she still does not trust Rogue at all. And the reason why, because Rogue used to be a bad guy when she first appeared in X-Men comics. And she had tried to kill off Dazzler multiple times. And so for Dazzler, it's kind of hard to adjust to the idea of working alongside with someone who had tried to kill you. And even though Rogue has shown multiple times that she is a good guy now, for Dazzler, she does not care. She still looks at Rogue as an enemy. And so while you have Dazzler in the training room, Rogue sees what she is doing in the danger room and gets upset about the idea that Dazzler doesn't trust her. But before you have the two characters able to talk to one another, you have Psylocke say, hey, Wolverine is calling for every single member of the X-Men for a very important meeting. We did jump over to Storm just real quickly because you have Storm and Naze arrive at the Grand Canyon. Now we already know this is not Naze at all, but he's still pretending to be Naze. And so you have the fake Naze tell Storm, we have to go on a spirit walk. We have to walk the rest of the way to hopefully find Forge, to hopefully save Forge from the adversary. And so you have Storm agree. Now again, this is still Storm showing us that she still has some kind of love for Forge because she's still kind of concerned for him. But at the same time, you have Naze, the fake Naze, pretending to flirt with her to kind of keep her on his side long enough so that he is able to use her to accomplish his own goals. Now, the rest of this chapter is really more of the X-Men heading over to San Francisco. And the reason why, because, well, Madeline Pryor is there. Wolverine got word that Madeline is there because she called up the X-Men wondering, one, why she's there, and two, 
where is her husband Cyclops? And so you have Wolverine inform Havoc, hey, man, your brother left his wife behind by herself and now she's in San Francisco. Where she should be is in Alaska. Either way, as soon as the X-Men arrive at the hospital, well, you have Psylocke tell the team, we are not alone. The Marauders are here as well. And so this leads into a few pages of really the X-Men fighting against the Marauders, trying their best to save the life of Madeline Pryor. But at the same time, they're trying to learn more about their enemies who just keep coming after them over and over again. And so it does take a while for this battle to actually end. But the tell end of this chapter, you have Rogue and Dazzler find out the Marauders have a new member on their team, and that would be Polaris. Now, Polaris did not really turn evil. She's being possessed by Malice, another mutant that has the ability to possess your body. And so even though our heroes see Polaris as the new leader of the Marauders, in reality, it's Malice in control of Polaris' body. But with her having control of Polaris' body, she's also able to use the powers of Polaris, which is really a hard challenge for Rogue and also Dazzler. But the battle must continue on. Now, we do jump into Uncanny X-Men number 223. Now, before we dive deep into this chapter, I do want to mention that we are going to go ahead and skip over a lot of content so that we are able to just go ahead and wrap up today's video. And so we do pick up with Storm and Naze once again. Now, when it comes to our two heroes in the Grand Canyon, it has reached nightfall. And so they're going to go ahead and build a campfire and then just take a break and wait until the morning to continue their search for Forge. Now, while you have our two heroes resting, well, out of nowhere, a random woman appears. Now, when it comes to this woman, she does beg for our hero's help because she says that she's been followed and attacked by someone close to her. And we kind of find out it is her brother. Now, at first, you do have Storm and Naze wanting to protect her from her attacker, her brother. But we kind of find out that was a big fat lie. That her and her brother are actually working for the demonic being known as Adversary. The being that Forge was supposed to stop many years ago. And so now it shows this being is now beginning the process of trying to attack Naze, but also trying to attack Storm as well. And matter of fact, when it comes to the young lady who appeared at first as somebody who needed help, she turns into a creature, making it very hard for Storm and Naze to actually win. But after a few pages, you do have our heroes being able to defeat her and her brother. And that is great because now Naze and Storm can really take a break, but also have the ability to continue on to look for Forge. But getting back over to the X-Men, the rest of the chapter is really more of the X-Men fighting against the Marauders. And honestly, it's a great battle, but you have the X-Men being able to win this battle almost really easily. Matter of fact, you have Wolverine being able to defeat Sabretooth very easily. And I feel so bad for the guy because this entire storyline, he has been getting his butt kicked left and right. But you do have our heroes being able to save Madeline Pryor. But the question is right now, what to do with her? Like, do you call up Cyclops and say, hey man, we found your wife. Um, She's not dead. She is actually alive and well. What should we do with her? But then on top of that, you have having find out that Polaris is now on the side of evil, on the side of the Marauders. Now, at first, it was Havoc believing that she's actually evil, but you had Psylocke say, no, I read her mind. There are two minds in her body, which means that she is being possessed by someone else. And that right there does bring some comfort to Havoc, but at the same time, she still leaves with the Marauders. And so for Havoc, it's kind of a hard pill to swallow, the idea that you just lost your girlfriend to the side of evil. 
But this is where we are. Okay, so getting back into our coverage over X-Men comics as we work our way up to the Fall of the Mutant story arc, our crossover, we do jump back over to Uncanny X-Men number 223 and 224. Now you're probably wondering, hey Fresh, we already have been covering Fall of the Mutants. Yes, you are correct. The only difference is that when it comes to Fall of the Mutants, it's not really a proper crossover. So you do have three different X-Men teams, X-Men, X-Factor, and also New Mutants. But the three teams, they don't even cross over in this supposed crossover or this supposed X-Men event. Each X-Men team is handling their own certain kind of problems. And so when it comes to X-Factor, their main problem was dealing with Apocalypse in Manhattan. When it comes to the X-Men, well, their main problem is technically taking place in San Francisco with the idea of finding Madeline Pryor. Now remember, around this time, Madeline Pryor was married to Cyclops. And so over in X-Factor Comics, he has no idea that his wife is even alive. But she is. But here's the thing. She's now wondering where is their son? And that would be Nathaniel Summers. Of course, that would be Cable down the road, but we have no idea where he is at and neither does she. But luckily for her, the X-Men were able to save her from the Marauders. And so now the question is, where do we go next after bringing in somebody who's now looking for their son? And so getting into the opening pages of Uncanny X-Men number 223, we do pick up with uh, Crimson Commando and Stonewall joining Freedom Force. Now remember, these are two characters we saw in Uncanny X-Men number 215 and 216. In that two-part story arc, we had learned that these two guys were World War II superheroes. But after the war had ended, they were forced to retire. The problem was they realized the world still needed them. And so they came out of retirement and began to use their powers to hunt down bad people. Now, they would kidnap people and then release those people in the forest to actually hunt them down. Now, they did that to Storm, but Storm was able to convince them that what they were doing was actually wrong. And so they turned themselves in over to law enforcement. Now, we kind of find out they're joining Freedom Force now. Now, remember, Freedom Force was a team we saw in the earlier parts of our coverage over the X-Men that was put together by the government as a way to take care of different problems around the world, especially in America. Now, when it came to Freedom Force, it was just Mystique's old team, the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, being relabeled with a new name and working for the government. So you're talking about Mystique, Blob, Pyro, Avalanche, and Destiny all now working for the government, but now being introduced to their two new members. We also kind of find out the third person of the original group we saw back in Uncanny X-Men number 215 and 216 is also alive, and that would be the Super Saber. And we saw for a short period of time in that two-part story arc, we believe that he was dead, but kind of find out here that he is alive and he's also joining the team. Now, out of nowhere, you have Destiny scream. And when she screams, Mystique gets very worried because we have to remember, even way back then in the 1980s, Mystique and Destiny were in a relationship with one another. But you have Destiny try to use her ability to see possible futures of what happens to Rogue. But apparently, the only thing she sees is pure darkness. The idea of the X-Men are no longer going to be around. Like, she was focusing on Rogue, but once she could not see Rogue, she tried other members of the team. But as well, she could not see their future, which means the X-Men could possibly die down the road.
And so then we check in with Storm and we currently get reminded that she's on a spirit walk with a character known as Naze. Now we learned in our last video that this is not Naze at all. This is some other kind of being pretending to be Naze as a way to do something horrible to Storm and possibly forge down the road. Because the original Naze was somebody who taught forge magic to hopefully use that magic to fight against a demonic being known as the adversary. Now remember, in our last video, Storm was trying to find Forge to hopefully have her powers given back to her. She was trying to regain her powers, but unfortunately Forge had disappeared. And so you have this fake Naze tell Storm that he is somewhere in the Grand Canyon and they're walking around trying to find Forge to hopefully help him because apparently Forge is being controlled by that demonic being, again, better known as the adversary. And so you have Storm just doing her best to keep pushing forward. But Naze, the fake Naze, is now pretending to be seriously ill to the point where now Storm is gonna have to take care of him. Now we also cannot forget that technically tension is high right now between humans and mutants because the last few story arcs by Chris Claremont, he's trying to paint the picture that you have more and more humans beginning to hate on the mutant race. And this is beginning the process of new groups popping up left and right to find new ways to actually attack the mutants. Now this one page is really showing the racism when it comes to the humans who are hating on mutants and you actually have people trying to convince them like hey what you are doing is wrong the idea of hating on mutants but now you have more and more humans no longer caring we did jump over to the X-Men, and when we do, we see them in San Francisco. Now, when it comes to the X-Men, they're sticking around here because, one, they had just saved Madeline Pryor, two, they're wondering what are their next moves, and three, let's not forget, the X-Men are still trying to paint this picture of the idea that they are dead right now to the entire world. They want the world to believe they are no longer alive. Either way, you have the X-Men also training in this old prison. Now, we have to remember that most of the X-Men around this time are new members. Longshot, Dazzler, Psylocke. Now, Rogue been on the team for a while, but she's still labeled as a new person because most of the old team members are injured, have left the team, are currently on a different team. And so now Wolverine is in charge of the X-Men until Storm is able to come back and retake her position. But this is also Wolverine wanting to teach the new X-Men team members, hey guys, listen, fighting is very important. And not the idea of how to fight, but to know when you actually won a fight. Because you have Ro thinking that she was able to take down Wolverine so easily. But once he's able to get the upper, upper hand on her and show her that she got too cocky, that she always needs to be on her toes, you have the other team members realize what Wolverine is trying to teach them. Because out there in the real battle scene, you're not going to have someone just give up so easily. They're going to play dirty until you are able to actually win. We did jump over to Madeline Pryor. And this is really important for future story arcs down the road, especially the Inferno story arc we're going to cover here in a couple of weeks or months. Either way, when it comes to Madeline Pryor, she's wondering why her husband has not been looking for her. Now, what she does not know, he has been trying to find her and their son. But unfortunately for Cyclops, he was told that Madeline and their son had never existed at all. Now, we already know that is a huge fat lie. But for Cyclops, he's kind of wondering, okay, if I'm being told one thing, then how in the world I'm going to prove that they are all wrong, that she is alive? How can I find her? How can I find our son? And so that is the big issue. But also for Madeline, she's wondering, where is her son? Because 
everybody she goes to, they're telling her, hey, we have no records of a child named Nathaniel Summers at all, which means you have to be lying to us or you have gone crazy in the head and believed that you had a son. And so you have having just, you know, running by, but he sees Madeline on a cliff and thinking that she is about to commit suicide. And so then we jump over to Storm and Naze. Now, when we do, you have Storm beginning the process of trying to help take care of Naze, but she does give him some medicine. Now, when it comes to the medicine, it's supposed to help him fight against the poisoning that he had received in our last video. Now, right before he's able to drink some of the medicine, he does ask Storm to also drink some of the medicine as well, just in case she was also poisoned like he was in our last video. So she does take the medicine, but this begins one heck of a mind trip for Storm because out of nowhere, you have a huge bear appear. And this is really a huge bear, but Storm cannot do much to it because she does not have her powers. She needs to find Forge to not just help Forge out, but to also have Forge give her powers back so that she can be an X-Men again, a true X-Men again. But either way, once she's able to lose the bear, she then runs into a huge snake. And again, she's trying her best to fight against the snake. But while fighting against the snake, she realized the weather has changed. It was a sunny day, but now it's a full-on blizzard. And so after getting rid of the snake and tries her best to climb away from all the fighting she had just done with the bear and snake, she realized behind her it's no longer a blizzard. Matter of fact, the ground behind her now turned into some kind of battlefield for some kind of war, possibly the Vietnam War. And the question is, why? Now, when she turns around and look at the very top of the cliff, she sees Forge. And so once she finds Forge, she realizes that this is an evil Forge who is talking about the idea of helping out the adversary. And when it comes to Storm being around, she could be the final piece to help him actually achieve that goal. Now, you do have Storm out of nowhere being able to stab Forge, which of course does kill him. But... After he is supposedly dead, we come to find out that this was just a vision, a whole mind trip to help Storm realize that she has to kill off Forge because if she doesn't, Forge could be the reason why the adversary arrives in the real world. And that would be a huge problem. Now again, that is what Naze wants or this fake Naze wants because after you have Storm tell Naze, I realize I have to kill Forge to save the world. Homeboy's just smiling creepily behind her, telling us, yeah, he's actually evil. And so getting back over to Madeline Pryor, well, we kind of find out that she was about to commit suicide, but luckily for her, Havoc stopped her. Because you have Havoc say, listen, don't do this because if you believe that your son is still alive and we know that he has to be alive, don't do this. You want to be there for your son once we are able to find him. Yes, my brother may have failed you, but let's not fail your son here. And if you are looking for people to care for you, love you, then look at the X-Men because we are a family. And that is this chapter, but... This also could be the beginning of Havoc possibly falling in love with Madeline Pryor. And so when we jump into Uncanny X-Men number 224, we do pick up with Storm saying goodbye to Nays. Now, when it comes to this goodbye, it's really more Nays saying, the final part of this spirit walk is really up to you. If you want to be able to stop Forge, it all comes down to you. Now, before Storm leaves, she does ask one question. She wants to know more about the adversary. Now, when it comes to Naze 
He does not really dive much into the actual origin of the character, but he does tell Storm that when it comes to adversary, his main goal is, again, to recreate reality. And the reason why? Because he is a trickster. And sometimes tricksters love the idea of pulling strings. Unfortunately, the strings that he is pulling are the lies of innocent people. But when it comes to adversary, he's really big on recreating the universe in his own image and once he gets bored in what he had created he tries to do something new he tries to change things up because that is who he is either way you didn't have nays kiss storm now we're left to believe the reason why he did this because he had grew a bond with her but at the same time this is not really Naze. It's some demonic being that is pretending to be him. Now, you also have Storm kind of take that kiss to heart, which I kind of find a tad bit weird. And the only reason why, because she admitted earlier she still has feelings for Forge. But here you are now kissing the man who's kind of like a father to him, even though we know it's not really Naze. Either way, Storm walks away to go on the final part of her spirit walk. And so we then pick up with Freedom Force. Really, we pick up with Valerie Cooper, the person in charge of the actual team. Now, when it comes to Valerie, she's having a press conference about a new law that's about to come out saying that anyone who has superhuman abilities has to register with the American government, especially mutants. Now, when it comes to Valerie, she is the president's national security advisor. That is a very important role and why she is the leader of Freedom Force. But with that role, she began to bring up the problem of the mutant race because you do have mutants out there that are very dangerous. And matter of fact, she used the battle between the X-Men and the Marauders in her last video as an example of why mutants are dangerous. Because thanks to that battle, you did have a lot of innocent people be affected by that battle, which was a huge problem for her and so now this law is being made and she's trying to push more and more to her agenda of hey mutants are dangerous and we need some better laws in place now we do jump over to rogue and when we do you have rogue being confronted by mystique now this is Mystique telling Rogue what Destiny saw when it came to her visions about the idea of all the different kind of futures showed that the X-Men are going to die, including Rogue. And now let's not forget, Mystique and Destiny, they adopted Rogue. They kind of raised her for a short period of time. And so this is Mystique saying, hey, Rogue, listen, um, you're my daughter and my wife, our girlfriend, Destiny, just told me that she saw different kinds of futures where you are possibly dead and I cannot accept that. So leave the X-Men and come with me. But you have Rogue say no. And so Rogue walks away. Now, before Rogue walks away, you have Mystique say, listen, I know you are going to die because the X-Men are going to go to Dallas. Something in Dallas is about to happen. And when it does, you are going to die. But Rogue continues to walk away. And so do you have the X-Men reunite at a prison they're currently using as their base? Now, when everyone comes together, you have Rogue inform everyone what Mystique had just told her when it came to Destiny's visions about the idea that if the X-Men go to Dallas, they could die. Now, when it comes to Wolverine, he says, hmm, you know, I've known Destiny for a while now, and I've seen some times where she has been wrong. So... We honestly cannot believe right off the bat what she is saying could actually happen. But at the same time, it's Wolverine saying we still got to be careful because we still got three team members who are currently injured, Colossus, Nightcrawler, and also Kitty Pride. but also Storm is gone as well. So we're kind of short-staffed here when it comes to the X-Men. So if we go to Dallas, we got to be on our A-game here. And so you have the team agree to head over there and they also take Madeline Pryor with her. Now, you're probably wondering, why take her with you guys? She has no powers. Well, if they leave her alone, there's the possibility of the Marauders coming back after her all over again. 
And so then we jump over to Storm. Now, when we do, you have Storm on the final part of her spirit walk, and she sees all these different kinds of demons. And we're left to believe that these demons are coming from the reality where the adversary is from. And so you have Storm trying her best to kill off these demons left and right, left and right. But once she's able to get through all of them, she finds Forge. Now, Forge is very confused on why in the world is Storm there for, but before he is able to get an answer from her, she stabs him. She stabs him right in the chest. And he tells Storm, I was not trying to open up a portal to allow the adversary into our reality. I was trying to close the portal that was already opened. And once you have Storm realize that Forge was telling the truth, it's too late. The portal is now open. And Naze, sorry, not Naze, because honestly, it's not him at all. But the person that she believed it was, he appears to show her, hey, you were tricked by me. You believed it was really Naze, but I'm not Naze. I'm somebody else. But thanks to Forge no longer being able to close the portal, now the real fun can begin. And you have him say, you two were the only ones who could stop me. But now, with y'all out of my way, it's game time now. And this is where... Okay, so getting back into our coverage over the fall of the mutant story arc, we do pick up with the Uncanny X-Men and their part in this crossover. Because remember, this was not really a proper crossover. You did have three different X-Men teams at the time, but they really did not cross over with one another. They were all kind of handling their own certain problems. So for example, you had X-Factor dealing with Apocalypse, while you had the X-Men dealing with something else completely different. Now, when it comes to our heroes, they're on their way over to Dallas. And the reason why, because they're looking for their team leader, Storm, who went to Dallas to find Forge, because Forge has the ability to finally give Storm her powers back. But they haven't heard from Storm in a good while, and so they're trying to head there to see what in the world is going on with her. Now, before we are able to dive into the main fall of the mutant storyline, we have to pick up with another tie-in. And this time will be the Incredible Hulk issue number 340, where you have Wolverine the Hulk fighting again for the only second time in Marvel's history. The last time these two characters fought against each other was back in The Incredible Hulk number 180. And so for a lot of people, this was an actual tie-in for the fall of the mutant story arc because it does take place right before you have the uncanny x-men get into their main chapters of the entire story and so we get the chance to see wolverine fight against the hulk now there are some things i do want to talk about when it comes to the hulk around this point in time in marvel comics see the hulk is gray and the reason why because there was a storyline where bruce banner and the hulk were finally separated from one another, except they realized that Bruce could not survive without the Hulk. And so they had no choice but to go ahead and reemerge the two characters back into one. Now, after doing that, the Hulk was no longer green. He became, well, gray, like he was when he first appeared in Marvel Comics. Now, when it comes to Bruce, he is currently hanging out with Clay Quartermain and also Rick. And the reason why, because there are a stockpile of gamma bombs out there in the world that could possibly go off. And you are talking about the idea of producing more people turning into hulks in the world. And that would be a very 
horrible situation. And so you have our three heroes trying to find that stockpile of gamma bombs. Now, they're kind of on this cross-country road trip and they just arrived in Dallas, Texas. Now, when they do arrive, there is a blizzard out of nowhere and they're in this vehicle but because of the blizzard, they have to pull over. Now, for the Hulk, he's very upset because he has been inside the vehicle for a very long time. And so he wants out to stretch his legs. Now, you do have Rick wondering, is that really a good idea to let the Hulk out in Dallas? But you have Clay say, could you or me really stop the man if we wanted to? Which honestly is no. Now, the Hulk and his team are not the only team also arriving in Dallas. You also have the X-Men arriving as well because, again, they're trying to find their team leader, Storm, who came to Dallas looking for Forge. Now, they're also being affected by this blizzard. And matter of fact, you have the DFW airport tell them, you guys cannot land here. Like, Matter of fact, you are causing a lot of issues while being the airspace of our airport. You have to get the heck out of here. And on top of that, we have no way to help you land properly in our airport. Now, you do have Wolverine be Wolverine by saying something smart to tower control. But while they are talking, well, they realize something is coming towards them very fast. It's the Hulk. Now, they don't see the Hulk, but you do have Wolverine able to make the Blackbird dodge whatever was coming their way, which again was the Hulk. Now, because they were able to dodge the Hulk, the Hulk continue on to hit another plane that was nearby the Blackbird, and that plane begins to fall out of the sky. Now, you have Wolverine realize the plane is calling Mayday, and so Wolverine tells Rogue to get out there to use her powers to help land the plane properly on the ground. But he also tells Rogue to get rid of the engine inside of the plane, just Throw it somewhere, but pray to God it does not crash into somebody else. Which it does, because it does crash right on top of the Hulk. Which does make him very angry and wondering, why in the world did a random engine just crash on me? Now, Hulk has no idea that he had hit a plane. He knew he hit something, but because of the blizzard, he did not get an actual proper look. Now, when we pick up with the Hulk again, well, he began to get very hungry. And so he went out of his way to find a food truck, which honestly was not hard to do because of the blizzard. No vehicles are able to travel through the actual blizzard. And so once he finds a food truck, well, he begins to eat everything inside of it. But you didn't have the National Guard appear. Now, when the National Guards appear, they see the Hulk and they begin to freak out and they begin to shoot the Hulk and you have the Hulk get very upset about these guys shooting at him and so you have the Hulk try to fight against the guards now while they're fighting a bullet does cause the vehicle to actually blow up and the flames of the vehicle travels to a nearby apartment building and so with that apartment building now being on fire you have Wolverine tell his team hey guys go deal with that fire I am going to figure out what in the world actually caused that fire. Now, when it comes to Wolverine, he already knew the Hulk was nearby. And the reason why, because when it came to the Hulk hitting that plane earlier, Wolverine did some, you know, detective work by using his abilities to see what happened to the plane. And he picked up the scent of the Hulk. And when it came to the vehicle that caught on fire, that led to the apartment building getting on fire. Once again, Wolverine had picked up the scent of the Hulk knowing the Hulk was nearby. Now, while Wolverine is wondering what to do, you didn't have the Hulk appear and begin the process of fighting against Wolverine. Now, when it comes to our two characters fighting against each other, this is really important because like I said earlier, this is most likely the second time these two characters had ever fought against each other in Marvel Comics, but they're both trying to prove something to each other. Let me explain. So when it comes to Wolverine, the last time he was fighting against the Hulk, 
He was kind of like a savage beast that was assigned to bring the Hulk down. Now, when it comes to Wolverine, he's part of the X-Men. And with them being part of the X-Men, he has grown as a person. And he knows to try not to be a savage person anymore, but to try to be an actual person. And so when it comes to Wolverine, he's like, hey Hulk, I don't want to fight. Matter of fact, I'm leaving. Leave me alone. But for the Hulk, this is where his part of the battle comes in, what he is trying to prove. Because to the Hulk, he has gotten smarter ever since Bruce and him had re-emerged as one again. And so Hulk has gotten smarter and he wants to prove to all the different people that he had fought over the years that he is no longer that dumb green, you know, huge monster. He's now somewhat intelligent gray monster. And so that is his reason why he wants to fight against Wolverine, but to also prove that he can actually think of a strategy when it comes to fighting against different people and so you have two characters begin to try to show what they have done over the years the problem is they're both failing at it because you have the whole kind of showing that he's still kind of the big dumb gray angry monster he's not properly thinking of how to take down wolverine and when it comes to wolverine he's not being you know rational he's all like you know what you have hit me so many times you have brought back the old me the angry me and so i want to get rid of you as so you have the two characters fight against each other now the fight is actually stopped thanks to clay quartermain using a weapon that's really powerful enough to do some damage to the hulk but with that weapon you have clay say hey hulk what are you doing? You are wasting your time here fighting against Wolverine while you and us should be out there looking for all those bombs that could possibly go off. And so once you have Clay kind of get that message through Hulk's mind, you have Hulk realize, yeah, he's right. Even though I don't like the guy, he's right. And he leaves. But he kind of tells Wolverine, this is not over. And that wraps up this tie-in for the fall of the mutant story arc. And so then we jump into Uncanny X-Men number 225. Now, we do pick up with Colossus. And just in case you forgot, Colossus has been gone for a short while now. And the only reason why, because back in the Mutant Massacre storyline, Colossus was seriously injured. To the point where he was no longer able to be on the team until he properly healed. Alongside with Nightcrawler and Kitty Pride, who were also injured. Injured. Now, this is Colossus beginning the process of possibly coming back to the team. Now, you do have Colossus in the city where you had the X-Men fight the Juggernaut a couple videos ago. Now, when it comes to Colossus, while being there, he kind of realized that the X-Men are being blamed for what happened to this city. Even though the X-Men were the ones who had stopped the Juggernaut, they're still getting most of the blame because the city was completely wrecked. And you have Colossus finding out by hearing a bunch of children argue if mutants are actually human. Now there is one boy who kind of says mutants are humans and they're good and bad mutants, but you have the rest of the children look in the idea of mutants not being humans at all. And you have Colossus try his best to, you know, clarify things to make the kids have a better idea of what mutants truly are, but unfortunately most of the kids are not trying to listen. But after dealing with the children, out of nowhere, Colossus is confronted by a young lady. Now, when it comes to this young lady, she does ask Colossus, can he draw her? And matter of fact, she'll pay him for his drawing. Now, Colossus, he believes that he is a good artist, but not that great. But he's still down with the idea of doing artwork for somebody who is going to pay him. Now, while he's drawing her, well, out of nowhere, she disappears. But then there's a chess piece left behind. But the chess piece looks just like Colossus. And that is very confusing for our hero. 
But while you had Colossus examining the chess piece, you then had those same children reappear and begin to throw fireworks at Colossus. And the only reason why they're doing that is because Colossus got in the middle of their argument. But while you had these kids throwing fireworks, well, out of nowhere, Colossus begins to turn back into his metal form. Now, this right here is going to be very huge in the next couple sections that we are about to talk about about but we have to jump over to a different character and so we then jump over to a place that's between realities and we do pick up with the character known as the adversary now the adversary is the main bad guy for the last couple of videos that we have been doing he is this demonic being from a different reality that have been trying to get into earth's reality to begin the process of you know recreating the universe in his own image now he has been stopped over the years by native americans but the last person who was supposed to stop him was Forge. Now remember, at the end of our last video, Storm was tricked by the adversary to think that Forge had just gone crazy or Forge was possibly being controlled by the adversary to only find out that Forge was never being controlled by the adversary. That matter of fact, Forge was trying to close the portal to not let this demonic being be able to reach Earth's reality. But Storm has stabbed forge at the end of our last video which then gave way for the adversary to begin the process of possibly getting rid of the entire universe because when it comes to adversary he's better known as this great trickster he's able to trick people to help him achieve his goal but he's also known as the great weaver because his goal is to keep changing the universe until he is actually satisfied now we do see him talking to Lady Roma. Now, when it comes to Lady Roma, I'm not going to really dive into it right now who she actually is, but she is the daughter of Merlin, and she comes from Otherworld. Now, I want to say around this time that she was the guardian of the Omniverse. I could be wrong about that. If I am, please let me know in the comments below. If I'm correct, again, please let me know in the comments below. But when it comes to Lady Roma, she's trying to fight against the adversary, and apparently the two characters are playing against each other in a game of chess. Now it's not really chess, but all the different pieces on the chess board are different characters who are being affected by this storyline, mainly the X-Men. Now when it comes to Adversary, he believes that he has won only because he had removed Storm and Forge off the board. But it seems like Lady Roma is talking about the idea that he has no idea about her other pieces, including Colossus. But getting back over to Colossus, I want to dive into what is currently happening with him. So after having that huge argument with the children, but being attacked by them and going into his metal form, we kind of find out that Colossus is no longer able to just easily turn off his metal form. And this is most likely because of his injury from the Mutant Massacre storyline. And so because of that injury, Colossus just has to try really hard to turn human, but at the same time, he can't keep that form for a very long time. But you also have Colossus in this section expressing the idea of how upset he is when it comes to mutants being hated on, especially the X-Men, a team of characters that came together to not just help, help Charles Xavier achieve his goal, but to also help out the human race whenever they're in danger and so when it comes to colossus he does not understand why the human race hates the x-men so much why the x-men are being blamed what happened to their city where in reality it was the juggernaut now you also have colossus tell us that when it comes to his you know powers not working properly he's also a whole lot stronger and so he has to learn how to control his strength now he is able to call up his sister, Ileana, aka Magic, and she appears out of nowhere. Now, this is one of those quick brief crossovers between the two X-Men teams, but it's only for a couple seconds here because you have Colossus asking his sister, can you take me over to where the X-Men are at? And she said, yes, just come with me and I'll teleport you over there with them. 
But speaking of the X-Men, they do arrive in Dallas, where they do arrive at the place that belongs to Forge. Now, Rogue is flying around on the outside of the building, but she is able to look inside, and she can tell the place is completely wrecked. And you have Rogue wondering what the heck happened there, and she tells Wolverine what she saw. Now, when it comes to Logan, he tells his team, hey, stay behind, let me go inside first to see what in the world happened here, and then maybe later on, you guys can come in as well. Except when you have Wolverine walk in, every single machine that was left behind to protect the place begins to attack Wolverine. And so you have the rest of the X-Men work together to get Wolverine out of there. The problem is, as soon as they were able to get out of there, they are confronted by Freedom Force. Now, remember, when it comes to Freedom Force, they were originally known as, well, the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, the second version of the team that was being led by Mystique. Now, over the years, she has switched sides and joined the government. Now, the only reason why she has joined the government, because they're going to forgive every single one of them for the crimes that they had forgiven if they had to do different missions for the government. Like for example, go after different criminals, especially mutants, and bring them in. Now we have seen Freedom Force in other books like X Factor, but this is them coming after the X-Men to arrest the X-Men. Now, they're not only there to arrest them, they're also there to help protect the X-Men because of Destiny. Remember, in our last video, Destiny told Mystique that she had been looking into different futures to see what would happen to their adoptive daughter, Rogue. In every single future that she looked into, Rogue and the X-Men were dead. And so it was her goal to kind of find a way to save Rogue and the X-Men to protect their daughter. And so even though Freedom Force is here to arrest the X-Men, they're also trying to protect them. But the X-Men are technically not listening, and it does lead into a battle between both sides. Now, while you have both sides fighting against each other, you also have Colossus appear. And when he does appear, he does kind of help out when it comes to fighting against Blob. But you didn't have Destiny wanting to say again, we are not here to fight you guys. But in the middle of the fight, you did have each side being able to grab a hostage. Freedom Force was able to grab Rogue while you had the X-Men grab Mystique. Now you have the X-Men retreat back inside the building of Forge only so they can think of a game plan on how they're going to deal with Freedom Force. So while you have the X-Men hiding inside the building, out of nowhere, the sky is ripped open and a beam of light shoots right down on the building. And we're left to wonder what in the world is possibly going to happen to the X-Men. And so then we dive into Uncanny X-Men number 226. Now, when we do, we pick up with the X-Men hiding out in the building that belonged to Forge, while you have Freedom Force just standing there, literally doing nothing at all. Now, the reason why they're not doing anything, because of Destiny. She's freaking out about what could happen to the X-Men. And she clarifies that when it comes to what she saw in the future, if anybody is inside the building that belonged to Forge, something bad is about to happen to them. But she has no idea what. And that is very, very huge. And so you have the X-Men hear from Mystique what Destiny is actually talking about, or what Mystique had learned from Destiny before they arrived at this mission. And so you have Mystique say, we have to leave the building, but we also have to get the other people away from the building as well in the surrounding area just in case anything bad happens to them but you didn't have Longshot say hey guys you know I'm new to your world but does your son usually beam down in one area and that's it because they were battling in the night and out of nowhere this beam of light is glowing right on top of Forge building and now our heroes are wondering what's happening 
Now we do jump over to two reporters and their names are Manoli and also Neil. Now when it comes to these two characters, they do remind us what's happening in Dallas at the moment. An entire blizzard in the middle of the summer, which we already know should not be possible. As someone who lives in Texas, let me tell you, that should most definitely not happen at all. But either way, when it comes to these two reporters, they're realizing that a lot of weird things have been happening in Dallas over the last couple of days. The blizzard and now this beam of light that's surrounding this particular area. Now they are the first two to arrive at the scene when it comes to all the different news channels in Dallas, but their goal is to get the news out first to warn everyone what they are currently seeing. We then jump over to Freedom Force and their few hostages of the X-Men, where you have Dazzler being the one to wake up first out of all of the hostages. Now you have Dazzler also realize that the Freedom Force team is not looking at her, so she should be able to use her powers to blind them just temporarily long enough so that her, Psylocke and Rogue can get the heck out of there. The problem is Spiral was unaffected by her actual attack and so Spiral was able to begin to attack Dazzler in the most brutal kind of way. She grabs Destiny Mask, puts it on Dazzler's face and then stabs the mask to the face of Dazzler with a knife. So we're left to wonder is the mask really stuck on Dazzler's face? If it is, that really sucks. Now she does go after Psylocke as well and kind of express the idea that she does not like Psylocke at all because she is a psychic. But before you have Psylocke being able to be killed off by Spiral, you did have Rogue appear. And you have Rogue try her best to also battle against a six-armed sorcerer. We did pick up with Storm and Forge, and we kind of find out our two heroes are on another Earth. Now, this comes after Storm has stabbed Forge in the chest, which means that Forge was unable to close the portal that had allowed Adversary to come into the other Earth, the main Earth. And so the Adversary had put Storm and Forge on a complete different Earth as a way to say, this is your prison, but now you have Storm wondering, what's the point of that? Because if we are two people who have the ability to actually stop you, why would you give us an actual prison where we can live a normal, peaceful life? What is the purpose of that? Now, before Forge is able to explain things to Storm, you then have Forge pass out once again because of his stab wound. But when we jump back over to the main Earth, the main Marvel Universe, we come to find out that the adversary is beginning to work on reality. You have reality changing all over Dallas, Texas. Different kind of creatures popping up left and right. Different kind of beings from different worlds are coming into Dallas, Texas, attacking innocent people. Now you're probably wondering, hey, where are the Avengers? Where are the Fantastic Four? Where are the rest of the superhero teams? Well, they can't come to help out because what's happening in New York at the moment, because while this was happening, X Factor was dealing with Apocalypse. And so that is why you don't have a crossover between X Factor and the X-Men because they're so far apart from one another, but they're also dealing with two different kinds of things. But either way, you have Wolverine and Mystique agreed to call a truce to work together to help protect the innocent people from all these different kinds of creatures that have been brought here by the adversary. Now, we do jump back over to Storm and Forge, and I want to establish the idea that time moves differently on this other Earth. Let me explain, because the last time we saw Storm and Forge, Forge was still recovering after Storm had stabbed him. But now we see our two heroes being able to travel across this new world. But months have passed by between the two moments. And so that is how Forge is able to travel now. Now when it comes to Forge and Storm, well, they travel to the same location that you had Forge try to use his magical powers to close the portal on the adversary back on the other 
another earth. And so the reason why they traveled to the same location on this earth was hoping to get back home to their own reality. But the problem is the adversary made sure that all different traveling points are different areas on this earth and possibly other earths across the multiverse cannot be used by Forge. And so our heroes are technically stuck there now when it comes to forge he's really down with the idea of just staying here and actually making a life now for storm she can't do that because she feels responsible for the idea that she released the adversary on their home earth and now their home earth could possibly be erased but she's also still dealing with the idea that she was tricked by the adversary because the last two videos she believed that she was hanging out with Naze, the guy who was kind of like a father to Forge, to only find out that was never Naze at all. And you have Forge say, you know what, in my heart, I believe that Naze has been gone for a good while. But again, when it comes to the adversary, he is a great trickster. But you have Storm walk away to kind of have some time to herself to actually think, could her and Forge actually build a life on this new Earth? Now back on the main Earth, we do pick up with the X-Men and Freedom Force still trying to help out innocent people, but this leads into an interview between Mystique and one of our reporters from earlier, where you have our reporters asking Mystique, why are you working alongside with the X-Men? You are Freedom Force. You were assigned and put together to go after mutants like these guys right here and other bad mutants across the world. But it's Mystique saying, hey, look around you. Right now, we have no choice but to work alongside with them. But then you have Havoc jump in and say, what makes a hero? Please tell us what makes a hero because multiple times over the years the x-men have gone out of their way to help protect this earth not just themselves but humans as well and here y'all go again trying to paint this picture as the x-men being evil that mutants are evil what the heck is wrong with you guys now when it comes to our heroes they have no idea that all of this is being done by the adversary but they do realize it has to be somebody with a huge amount of magic. And the way they learn is that you have Spiral trying to undo what she did to um, Dazzler earlier with the idea of stabbing a knife through a mask onto Dazzler's face. But the problem is now Spiral is unable to fix her spell, to undo her spell. And she tells Colossus and Psylocke, it seems like someone outside of my magical abilities is actually blocking me. And that tells our heroes, okay, that means we're going up against someone with a huge amount of magical ability. And so you then have our heroes begin to learn about the adversary by a group of Native Americans who do appear because all realities are being mushed together into one pile of goo, technically. And so you do have this group of Native Americans tell uh, Crimson Commando what is currently happening here is someone known as the adversary and this is where our heroes are able to get a small bit of information about their enemy but unfortunately the Native Americans are killed off by a group of racist people well it seems to be racist people but either way you do have them go ahead and kill off the Native Americans and so now our heroes are unable to learn Learn anything about the adversary like they were hoping to. Now getting back over to the other earth, we kind of find out another year has passed by since the last time we saw our two heroes. But you have Storm coming back to Forge and realizing that he was able to build an entire house for him but being powered up by solar power energy. Either way, you did have our two heroes being able to come back together and re-establish their love for one another. Now. Here's the thing, because now the question is, what is our heroes going to do now if they're going to stay here on this other Earth or the possibility of trying to find a way back home to their Earth? 
And so then we jump back over to the X-Men. Now, when we do, we pick up with Colossus going over to Comfort Destiny. Now, this is really important because this is where Colossus learns that Destiny has been looking into multiple timelines to see what could possibly happen to the X-Men if they do things differently in each and every single timeline. But she only got the same outcome over and over again, where the X-Men have died except when colossus walked over she's kind of like wait a second you are not in any of my visions at all which means that you have the possibility to change things when it comes to the future of your team now she does tell colossus that she has seen all different kinds of futures if the earth is going to survive the x-men have to to die that is the only way to save the future of the earth and so you have colossus agree and decides to kind of be the one person to sacrifice himself to hopefully save the day now psylocke sees what colossus is trying to do and you have psylocke read the mind of colossus now once she does she learns that colossus had an entire conversation with lady roma and again she is the guardian of the omniverse and so you have Psylocke say, wait a second, Colossus, if you were technically contacted by Lady Roma, that means she's one, trying to help us, or two, she needs our help to make sure all reality is put back in place. But either way, we have to go to the very top of Forge Building, Eagle Plaza, to hopefully end all of this mess. But getting back over to Storm and Forge, you have our two heroes wondering, okay, what could be our next move here? We can stay here on this earth and begin the next human race on this earth and then become gods as we pass on, or we can try to go back home to our earth and help out our friends to defeat the adversary. But the thing is, Storm's wondering, okay, first idea, not really bad. Second idea, also not bad, but the problem is we have no way getting back home, except you have Forge say, oh, don't worry, while you were gone, I kind of thought of a new way that could help us get back home. But we have to go to the very top of that mountain right there to be able to achieve that goal. But getting back over to the main Earth, you have the X-Men and also Freedom Force working together and trying to reach the top of Eagle Plaza. But on their way there, they're being confronted by different kinds of obstacles because reality is constantly changing. Now, they also have a fellow state trooper with them as well, who's kind of helping out, but he is a huge racist towards really anybody who's not him. So mutants, Asians, and the list goes on. But either way, you didn't have Wolverine tell Mystique to take her and her team back to the outside area of the building. And the reason why, because he wants to make sure that if this is a trap, at least there'll be a team left behind to continue to help out the innocent people of this area. And so let the X-Men die, but hopefully you guys can live on. Now, this is really a huge moment because one of the reporters is still there as well recording all of this to hopefully show the world what the X-Men are trying to stand for. The idea that mutants are not evil, that mutants are humans, that mutants are just trying to help out the human race, which is honestly pretty cool. Now, getting back over to Storm and Forge, this is where we're also going to establish the return of Storm's powers. While she was traveling around this new world, Forge was also able to create a device that should help restore her powers. And once he does use it on her, at first it doesn't work properly, but then it does. So guys, the ones who've been in my comment section saying, I don't like Powerless Storm, don't worry, she finally has her powers back once again. Which, honestly, 
pretty great. But either way, you didn't have our two heroes begin the process of traveling back over to their Earth, the main Marvel Universe. But while doing that, we kind of find out back on the main Earth, when it came to that state trooper earlier, it was really the adversary pretending to be someone else. But now he realized what's happening, that Storm and Forge are trying to make their way back over to this Earth. And so now you have our villain here kind of upset but also kind of down to accept their challenge. And this leads us into the final chapter of Fall of the Mutants for the X-Men. And so that leads us into the final chapter for the fall of the mutants for the X-Men. Because while you have the X-Men inside the Eagle Plaza, you do have everyone outside wondering, will the X-Men actually survive? But on top of that, they're also wondering what could happen to the rest of the world if the X-Men fail. Now, luckily for the X-Men, one of the reporters is with them inside Eagle Plaza. And the reason why I say luckily, because on the outside, they are able to see what the X-Men are going up against, thanks to the guy carrying around a camera that's feeding back over to the television inside the van. And so you have the Freedom Force team and also the other reporter being able to see what the X-Men are going up against. Now, there is something I forgot to mention because because yes, she's been part of the team, but she doesn't really play a huge role in this storyline. And that would be Madeline Pryor. And when it comes to Madeline Pryor, let's not forget that she is married to Cyclops around this time. But she has no idea where Cyclops is at. And on top of that, Cyclops has no idea that she is alive. Because over in X Factor, he believes that his wife is currently dead. Not knowing that she's alive and with the X-Men. Matter of fact, when it comes to the X-Men, they've never really seen X Factor yet. And so they have no idea that X Factor is is Cyclops, Jean Grey, Iceman, Beast, and Angel, sorry now, Archangel, be the new team of mutants. But either way, because she was with the X-Men, she also went inside Eagle Plaza. Now, while being inside Eagle Plaza, she sees a flashback of young Forge. Now, there is something that some fans may forget about Forge, is that he fought in a war. And because of that, he lost an arm and leg. Now, when it comes to Forge, though, we kind of find out that there was a time where he tried to use the powers of the adversary to actually defeat people who had killed off his fellow soldiers to help him win a certain battle. And so he uses souls of his fallen soldiers to open up a portal from the adversary's realm and release a bunch of demonic beings to kill off the other soldiers who had just killed off his friends. Now, once he realized what he has done, he then called in a airstrike. And now Madeline kind of saw this flashback and she has some bad thoughts about Forge. Now, getting back over to Storm, Forge, and also Lady Roma, we see that they're being held captive by well, the adversary, but he also took over the Starlight Citadel. And so with them being able to control that, he believes that sooner or later, he should be able to take over reality completely and get rid of this universe. But again, he has no idea that Lady Roma has a certain character that she is hoping that could possibly help them win this battle against adversary. Now, when it comes to the X-Men, you have the X-Men see the Starlight Citadel, and their main goal is to find a way up there. But the problem is, every single time they try to get close to it, they get sent right back down, crashing into the ground. Now, they do have a bright idea on how they're going to get up there, and that involves Longshot. See, when it comes to Longshot, his bones are very hollow, so he should be able to carry all of them up there to the Starlight Citadel by riding the currents. Now, I don't feel like that would work in real life, but hey, who knows? So, you do have our heroes being able to fly up to the Starlight Citadel, and that begins the battle against them and the adversary. 
And so with the X-Men being able to ride the currents and actually arrive at the Starlight Citadel, with Longshot being the first to go in there, he does throw his knives right at the adversary. Now, here's the thing. It actually does damage to the adversary because his knives are covered in iron. Iron is a certain weakness for the adversary. Now, when it comes to Wolverine, he believes any kind of metal should be able to do damage to the adversary. But you have our bad guy here tell Wolverine, no, that is not the case. Your claws are covered in adamantium, and that would not do any kind of damage to me at all. But Colossus who can turn his body into iron can actually cause some damage to the adversary. And with Colossus being the hidden piece of Lady Roma, he was able to do a lot of damage to the adversary. And with him doing that, Rogue was then able to begin the process of absorbing the powers of adversary. Now with her doing that, she was able to open up a portal to begin the process of sending him back home where he came from. And so that leads into the X-Men trying to find a way to push the adversary all the way inside the portal and then actually close it. But that runs into one problem. See, when it comes to the adversary, he is a magical power being, meaning that the only way to defeat him is by using magic. And so even though the portal is open, they can't push him all the way inside because all their powers are not magic based. And Rogue is using her newfound powers that she had gained from Adversary to keep the portal open long enough to send him through. But then, even if he goes through the portal, how are you going to close the portal? Because the portal has to be closed by somebody who knows how to. And again, Rogue doesn't. Now, luckily for our heroes, Forge does. And so you have Forge begin the process of trying to push the adversary through the portal. But here comes the next problem. How are they going to close it? And Forge says, we must use your guy's souls to be the reason why the portal is bound closed to keep him away from this reality. You will be the key that will lock away his reality from ours. Now for the X-Men, even though they hate the idea that they're going to have to sacrifice themselves to be the reason why the adversary is defeated, they know it's the right thing to do as a way to protect the Earth. Now, something else to mention is that when it comes to the reporter that had been following the X-Men around, he still has his tape recorder or his camera, and he's recording everything that is currently happening. Now, this is really important because like we saw in X-Factor, because X-Factor had their way to help defeat Apocalypse to protect New York, it's now the X-Men finally being able to have proof that they're not evil. They're getting proof they are really a good team who are now going out of their way to give up their lives to save the entire world. And that's really important. And so you have Forge begin the process of turning our heroes into magical power beings or whatever to actually lock away the adversary reality to make sure that he can never come back ever again. Now, we also come to find out that because the reporter was recording everything, you have this video getting out to the entire world. Everyone is watching this, including Kitty Pride and Nightcrawler. And like I said earlier, they were two of the three characters who got injured in the Mutant Massacre storyline, and so they were removed from the team. But either way, back on Muir Island, they're seeing what the reporter is showing the world. The X-Men had given up their lives to save the entire world. To the world, the X-Men are now dead. And this is really huge. And for Nightcrawler and Kitty Pryde, they're wondering, what's next for them now for these two characters this is beginning the process of introducing another x-men team better known as excalibur 
Now, you didn't have Lady Roma appear after everyone had technically moved on with their lives, and she brings the X-Men back to life. Now, the reason why she does this is because she said, listen, when it comes to the adversary, he can never be locked away. He plays a very important role when it comes to the multiverse, and so unfortunately, he can never be locked away. You guys becoming the locks? We're not really going to stop him at all because he would just find another way to come into this reality. But right now he's being punished for what he has done, but he'll try again down the road. But either way, you have Storm say this works out perfectly then. The idea of them being alive, but the world believing that they are dead. And the reason why she is saying that because when it came to the X-Men, Storm and Magneto had this plan to make the world believe that they were dead. Because the X-Men had way too many different enemies just popping up left and right trying to kill off the X-Men. But on top of that, friends and families were also being attacked as well because their connection with the X-Men. And so this is Storm saying, this works out great. If the world believes that we are dead, then we are able to move behind the scenes and get paid back against every single person who has done us wrong. And so now the X-Men are alive again and are able to continue.